No, just uh, uh, just on the photos that people would. Oh, because they, 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 had to they don't think they need to organize something. I don't know. Fancy one. Uh, I'm not keen on fancy restaurants. <laughs> we didn't have, you know, the, the little 
il n'y a pas de badge pour une fois Non, non on n'a pas pensé à faire des badges. Ah. Et bah, tu sais que je les garde tous. Quoi. Une boîte de chaussures, en fait, je garde tous mes badges. Moi aussi, j'ai une boîte à la maison avec euh, une quantité de badges. C'est incroyable. On aimerait bien les réutiliser pour la chasse. Que ça en fait beaucoup parce qu'on ne change pas le nom pour les gars de la fin. <rire> Peut-être d'université. De temps à autre. Merci.
Yes, but a long time ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so my time is pretty much romance. <laughs> that is to say, <laughs> so it's totally uh, random. <laughs> Interesting uh, debates, and I mean, uh, it's worthwhile taking this time uh, to, to to get into to engage in a an informed uh, exchange about ideas. The, the twenty plus ten format sometimes blocks uh, kind of. Uh,
Oui, je suis bien installé. Je peux, je peux démarrer euh, quand vous <rire> Euh... Oh, on vraiment c'est plus dur de, de m'arrêter à 9h50. Ça, je le sais déjà. and good morning everybody. So the phenomenon in question is this. Uh, Ivan Colonna reproche à Monsieur Sarkozy de l'avoir présenté publiquement comme l'assassin avant qu'il ne soit jugé. In the, in the very same journal, Le Monde, uh, Sam Yazel, il y a désigner un inculpé avant qu'il soit jugé, c'est donc attenter à la liberté d'un homme que la loi même présume innocent. Donc, It appears that no here is optional without any obvious semantic contribution, and that's the phenomenon commonly known as expletive negation, the presence of a negative element in a sentence that, that, that does not express a negated proposition. And if you look at the French uh, book market, there are several titles on, on stock, on display, uh, with the somewhat <laughs> a catchy title, Before it is too late, avant qu'il soit trop tard, avant qu'il soit trop tard, avant qu'il ne soit trop tard, avant qu'il ne soit trop tard, avant qu'il ne soit trop tard. Then choose whichever you would like uh, to have. I, I, I've done all sorts of hypotheses. Is the right wing <laughs> political scene wrong in favor of expedient? You know, you might guess this, but it's not, uh, it's not terribly statistically valid. <laughs> so the open issue is it, do, do we have an instance of free variation here? And free variation has commonly been rejected as being simply unexplained variation, so uh, the linguist hasn't simply done his job uh, correctly. And there's a whole body of literature reviewed recently by Weber and Kopf, and there are even those who would like to exclude free variation from grammar on principal grounds, uh, according to some principle of no synonymy in construction grammar, for instance. However, No, there is no empirical justification for this pr principle in Geldberg's work. Uh, um, she admits herself, with one possible exception, all of the functional principles listed above are widely assumed and are sufficiently intuitive so that, so that the more extended defense of them is not attempted here. 
this has um, leveled criticism even from within construction the construction grammar camp. There's a nice article by a German colleague why the principle of no synonym is overrated, and there are those who are claimed that the burden of proof of proof is with those who postulate systematic variation rather than free variation. So I'm rather sympathetic uh, with this view. Anyway, um, the French linguistic uh, scene has tried to find ways out of this uh, undesirable uh, potential instance of free variation. Uh, the first strategy being that expletive need nerve would be nothing more than a historical relic, an archaic fact or a, a kind of grammatical fossil. The other camp says that the it's not free variation because expletive no does have interpretive effects. It might carry a virtualizing load, whatever that may be. Uh, it may have an intensifying effect. Uh, it may activate an evaluative layer of semantic meaning. But in my view, evidence for all these uh, sometimes conflicting <laughs> semantic, con semantic or pragmatic contributions equivocal at best, as can be seen in this uh, case, avant que le monde fut fait. Um, so the word was made happily, luckily for us, and it's not uh, virtualizing, it's maybe not evaluative. So you, you, I'm not too sure about this. Uh, then there's a typological recent study of expletive negation in the languages of the world, and we can find them in about 10% of the sample um, made up by Jin and Koenig. Uh, they themselves say that it's likely to be underreported because in some languages it seems to be only a dialect <coughs> or a substandard variant, and I'm, uh, I'm trying to get to grips with this. The principal licenses in the languages of the world are surprisingly uniform semantically, with uh, before clauses um, in the first place, followed by fear predicates. And then with some, let's say, um, um, the, uh, from the third place onwards, it's, it's not so common any longer. Uh, but then for French, you can find three principal types. There's a, uh, a fair number of object clauses, um, um, governed like by <coughs> inherently negative matrix verbs such as uh, craindre like, or their, their nouns, la crainte que empêcher de fondre, their correlative clauses uh, of inequality but also of equality, and there are adverbial clauses, in particular those introduced by sans que, à moi que, and avant que. So all in all, French then has a remarca remarkably wide area of licenses uh, from pan-romance and from uh, global typological perspectives, and arguably there has been a diachronic extension of, of licenses uh, in the history of French, and according <coughs> to some authors, an ongoing gen generalization. On the other hand, there are those claiming that expletive negation is reported to be in decline, and uh, there's a an eminent scholar, uh, <laughs> Pierre Larivé, uh, who even uh, suggested an, a gradual <laughs> extinction of expletive uses of ne in modern French uh, some years ago. So the open, I open issue number two for me, it, what's the curve of evolution of expletive ne after all? Um, and when it comes to synchronic variation, there are also opposing viewpoints. According to the first group of scholars, expletive ne is indicative of a high register, uh, a formal register, an elevated register, and uh, uh, this implies that it's um, rarely found in popular um, uh, registers, um, and, uh, and this has been stated uh, since at least the 1930s. Um, a second uh, line of research holds that the presence of expletive ne would be completely neutral, and this is the pos position adopted at some place in the uh, new reference grammar, um, uh, Grande Grammaire du Français. Uh, and uh, the other traditional reference grammar, uh, Grevis, has it that it would be something rather spontaneous, and that there, and um, other authors state that there are numerous examples found in spoken language, and you can even find attestations in primary dialects of the long uh, in West, in, in Walloon dialects, with the exception to the westernmost uh, part, according to the Atlas Linguistique de la Wallonie. And now, open issue number three, then, what's the variation across speech and writing? Is there variation between different text types? In any event, uh, expletive ne has been around since early old French. Here's an example from the Ville de Saint Alexis, uh, and here's another one from the Chanson de Roland. Uh, the, but 
It has to be said that they are mostly found in object complement clauses and in comparative constructions, whereas they tend to be rare to non-existent in adverbial clauses, in particular in before clauses, uh, which were in old French uh, introduced by other subordinators such as einzweisque. And uh, here it has been stated that the expletive ne remains marginal until early modern French. <coughs> so in the 17th century, uh, Expletive nice gradually lost in infinitival clauses and restricted to final uh, clauses, subordinate clauses, um, but, and it, has, uh, it becomes frequent, if not categorical, with some licenses, such as ne pas douter, uh, and it's rare to non-existent with other li items li that license ne in contemporary French. So there's a common assumption in the grammaticalization camp around, according to which the early rise of postverbal negators um, in, in the history of French would favor the refunctionalization of ne as an expletive element. It becomes free to fulfill other functions, whatever that may, uh, they may be on the semantic and pragmatic side. But then um, um, there's bipartite expletive negations in 17th century French, such as in this uh, example in six, pourtant les vignes se trouvèrent plus belles que l'on ne croyait pas. Um, and expletive par has survived until uh, present day varieties in uh, Quebec, plus, at least in the superlative construction, c'est plus belle qu'il n'y a pas sur le marché. So, are there any cross linguistically valid uh, uh, grammaticalization points? Now, the recent uh, uh, article by um, Paolo Ramat, according to him, expletive negation would be originally tied to the core concept of inequality comparison. Um, X is more, has more Y than that, Z, where Y refers to a state, a quality or property, as well as to temporal comparison, X before Y, where the second member is implicitly negated. It may then expand to other constructions, such as negative concord and the construction of fear verbs. But in French, um, this doesn't seem to hold, uh, since uh, expletive negation with fear verbs is solidly attested since uh, the earliest extant text, uh, whereas with before clauses, um, as, as I just mentioned, it's rare until way into the 18th century. And there's another uh, recent uh, um, doctoral dissertation done on expletive noir in French, uh, which also has a chapter on diachrony uh, by Tahara. And Tahara speaks of an erosion du sens modal, uh, going from prohibition semantics to apprehension, to frustration semantics. That is from défendre, to empêcher, to craindre. And in the 17th century, from the apprehension class, uh, ne, expletive ne would have spread to object, uh, from object to adverbial clauses, including before clauses um, of the type uh, uh, don't do this before it's too late, the, the abonconus were trop tard uh, type. However, expletive negation, again, with fear verbs, is solidly agnostic, uh, attested from the outset, and then uh, Tahar fails to provide an answer to the question how expletive ne in comparative constructions uh, fits into, into the picture. So the approach is uh, somewhat incomplete, uh, to say the least. Then um, I'd like to refer once more to Pierre Larivet's uh, work, uh, who found expletive uses of ne to occur very rarely in texts of less experienced writers, the peu lettré um, uh, um, corpora of the 17th and 18th century, according to the then available corpus made up by um, Ernst and Wolf, 2005. And within three journaux, that is, um, private diaries, he found only 19 instances of expletive usage among a total of 661 um, tokens of ne. And in con he also looked into a corpus of contemporary spoken French, such as the uh, Corpus du Français par les Parisiens des années 2000, uh, that there was not a single expletive among the first 300 tokens of ne. So what do we have to conclude from this? Luckily, there's a a, a second version available of the Ernst uh, Corpus, the new um, Ernst Corpus 2019 of the Texte Francais Privé, the 17th and 18th siècle. And here we have a total of 10 extensive and carefully transcribed texts written by average, ordinary people. And uh, I looked into the, uh, I looked at all ins of the instances of ne in, in the corpus, some 2,500, and um, I found this. So there's, um, with the fear, um, the, the, 
the, the overall numbers are not exceedingly high, I'm afraid. But then you can see that among 32 instances of uh, Kandre or Kanter or Peur plus uh, complement clauses, 19 have expedient no. Uh, the situation is different for avant -que. Just one single instance is among 17 cases of avant queue. And with comparative clauses, the use of net is almost categorical. You might say with 22 out of 24 instances. And the only counterexamples in con comparative clauses stem from counterfactual context. And in a phrase, non plus chaud que si c'est été entre la Toussaint et le Noël. And the only example of avant queue plus ne is phonologically ambiguous. Uh, parmi lesquels il ne lui restait que 800 militaires de plus de 6 000 qu'il en avait uh, avant qu'on eût formé le blocus. Donc, this, may not, this might be a spelling error. So, it, 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 it's, it's not very. It doesn't prove anything, uh, uh, to put it uh, this way. Um, so, but it, I, I'd like to suggest that at least with Crown and comparative clauses, at that time, at that moment, um, of the history of France, an ex extinction of expletive uses <coughs> might not yet or may not be observable. And then uh, a quick word about Italian, uh, coming to the issue of free back to the issue of free variation. For Italian, it has been stated that anti-factivity would be a verb, so that uh, in ten, parole domani alla stazione prima che non faccia qualche sciocchezza would be a perfect way of state. Well, the Italian name, Elisa, you, you say, you stop me if, if I'm wrong. But I think 11, there are no anti-factivity uh, uh, in the avant in, in the prima uh, clauses at play, uh, expletive negation is not licensed. So to the extent that this is true, and I got confirmation last week when I was in Italy, um, uh, this would make Italian quite different from French. There's no anti-factivity required meant in French, as can be seen, I repeat the example I just gave before, avant que le monde ne fût fait. And then the issue of non-veridicality, which always arises with before clauses. So it's different if you say um, um, Mozart had breakfast before he finished his opera, uh, so he did finish uh, the, the, La Flute, en Flute Enchantée, for instance, but uh, Mozart um, died before he finished his requiem, so here we have non-veridicality, but this follows from the lexical semantics of die. So it's not a fact, a hardwired fact of grammar, in my opinion, and this has been cited by other authors at, as well. And there are other typical semantic correlates of expletive negation in before clauses uh, in the languages of the word, such as a negative preference stance or undesirability. But again, this seems to be unclear for me, uh, for in the case of French at the very least, such as, uh, consider examples such as 13, je n'ose rentrer avant que vous ne m'ayez pardonné. Donc here, undesirability doesn't seem to be at play. Now, uh, coming to the issue of uh, evolution for different text types, I started out with the formal text types because I thought uh, expletive no might be yes uh, might be more frequent in formal text types, uh, so pertaining to Distanzsprache in terms of Koch Österreich. And I looked into Frontex, and, and Wendy uh, has told us about all the issues that arise when you get to use Frontex. But for want of a better <laughs> corpus, it had to be Frontex, and I, I I selected the philosophic text because. They are available from the 17th to the 21st century. And the evolution is this. There's a, a quite a nice uh, increase in uh, the use of frequency from the 17th to the 20th centuries. There are no philosophical texts from the 21st century, unfortunately. So it's just, uh, I could just uh, look at these four centuries, but then the, the curve of evolution goes up. And, and then I, I try to identify uh, texts intermediate between distance and Nähe Sprache, and I looked at <coughs> what had, has been called in other circles ego document, such as private letters, diaries, or travel reports. And uh, so that's the, the écrit personnel genre uh, in, in, in Frontex. Uh, and here the increase was even steeper. So uh, we are 
uh, in the 20th century we, uh, we arrive at some 37.6 percent, and in the uh, in our century it's almost in half of the instances of our own clauses. Now you have to admit uh, that um, these uh, writings are by very experienced writers, so it's it's. It's, it's absolutely uh, different from the uh, Corpus uh, Ernst uh, and Wolf. And um, I, 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 I tried to, um, to do a comparison with Craindre and La Crainte Que. I, I couldn't do, I couldn't investigate all instances because you have always have to check them manually. But for, the, for a selection and, and manual elimination of false positives in the écrit personnel genre, you see that there's no such uh, increase observable for the fear predicate clause. So figures are high throughout. They vary so a bit, but th that might be due to chance. Uh, but they are high throughout. There's no increase uh, uh, in, in sharp contrast to what can be observed for our own cure clauses. Um, so uh, I, I try to differentiate, diversify a, a little bit uh, my materials. And I looked into the Bibliothèque Bleu. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's the Bibliothèque Bleu. And it's a collection of uh, an enormous collection of popular French books, cheap and for a broad readership, uh, addressing a broad variety of subjects ranging from the pious to the practical and to the entertaining. And there are popular features according to uh, when they are Hispanic, juxtaposed with law and So it's a hybrid genre. It's not it's not lower class speech uh, reflected faithfully. Uh, and here uh, figures were low until the 18th century, and then there's a total of only 20 tokens for the 19th century because they fade out in the 19th century. And, uh, but what I found interesting, uh, there are false positives, what I found interesting is that the very first attestation of avant curve with expletive only in 1786, that is to say by the end of the great uh, success of the Bibliothèque uh, Bleu. And then um, how can we uh, get uh, traces of what has been called Nähesprache. I tried the Corpus 14, the, the private letters of soldiers fighting in World War I, and letters addressed to these soldiers. Um, this is a peu lettré uh, type of uh, corpus. And here the frequencies were low, but uh, there were some instances, so five out of 41. <coughs> in a spoken French corpora, I did the entire the entire CFPP 2000 corpus, I only found six expletives among some 2,600, and all of them were in comparative constructions. The situation is a little bit better for the ESLO corpus, um, where there are four out of 42, but the overall numbers are rather low, so I wouldn't venture to draw any firm conclusion from all this. Uh, another question I was asking myself, was this. Can linguistic prescriptivism mm -hmm. explain the rise of avant que plus ne? <laughs> uh, to start out, for a long time, uh, uh, expletive ne uh, was frowned upon by uh, normative grammarians and uh, remarqueurs, in particular uh, uh, after avant que. And it was only in the, in the course of the 19th century that avant que plus ne gradually came to be tolerated by official uh, grammars, and there had always been at attempts at eliminating free variation by providing rules of usage, such as the one proposed by Giraud Duvivier. On doit faire usage de ne toutes les fois qu'il y a du doute sur la réalité de l'action exprimée par le verbe qui vient après avant que. Now, normative grammars <coughs> have been quite, uh, let's say, uh, unclear about this, uh, if you take them together. and. Uh, it was in 90, you, you can really date the official acceptance of expletive ne, uh, which happened in the Journal Officiel on 26 February of 1901. And the argument uh, then was that the usage is just chaotic, it's, it's random, there is no systematicity anyway. L'emploi de cette négation dans un très grand nombre de propositions subordonnées donne lieu à des règles compliquées, difficiles, abusives, souvent en contradiction avec l'usage des écrivains les plus classiques. So, in the in the 20th century, then, uh, expletive uh, 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 finished by uh, gaining prestige. It was recommended in the ninth, but only in the ninth, in the latest edition of the Dictionnaire de l'Académie Française. Uh, however, if, if you go into the corpora, normative pressure doesn't seem to have had any recognizable impact, and the presence uh, of no remains erratic, as it has been aptly uh, formulated. 
So a quick word about German and then I come to my conclusions. In German we have the very same phenomenon. Before nicht klar ist, wohin es geht, tauscht keiner seine Wohnung aus. Der, uh, and it can also be for the classical text, Lessing, der wahre Virtuose glaubt es nicht, ehe er es nicht merkt. Um, and it can even be found, albeit infrequently, with positive predicates. Here's an example from uh, Krivka. And there have been proposals claiming minimal semantic differences. Uh, but uh, even those authors claiming this difference fail to provide minimal pets. So I'm, I remain uh, skeptical about these proposals. And Krivka himself admits uh, normally it doesn't play any role. So for me, it, it, it still seems to be a case of free variation. And then I looked into normative uh, grammars of uh, German, and here's uh, an interesting um, gentleman, Gustav Wustmann, uh, who wrote a book, Allerhand Sprachdummheiten, Kleine Deutsche Grammatik des Zweifelhaften, des Falschen und des Hässlichen. <laughs> and there are, it has been a, an enormous success, and there have been uh, various editions, and there have been uh, um, uh, refurbishments. And in the first edition, in the no late 19th century, his overtly against uh, this expletive negation. And in the 1940s, this was done by uh, successors, so it's a posthumous edition. Uh, uh, he's a bit more nuanced. He says it, it's, uh, it's redundant, but you can't say it's, it's outright uh, incorrect, um, since it has, now that it has found its way into the language of all circles. So, you know, when he gives up. Is confronted with the facts of reality, so you can't do anything about it anyway. So, in my opinion, uh, in the history of German, expletive narration has started out um, as a, let's say, as a condemned uh, variant, but then um, even the most uh, conservative ones have resigned in few factional usage, and it has finished uh, by becoming accepted as a totally, in my opinion, at least stylistically neutral variable. Whereas in French, has also been subject to normative criticism, at least in some contexts. The overall picture is more complicated. There have been attempts at systematization, but unsuccessful ones. There has been, as in German, uh, in, uh, a kind of re resignation in view of actual usage. It has gained acceptance and even prestige. And this last step, I think, it is what makes French different from other languages, such as uh, German and Italian. So, in conclusion, uh, I have been unable to detect any overall diachronic tendency for expletive no in French. It doesn't seem to be a unitary ph phenomenon. And in avant que clauses, what one might rather find is a diachronic widening of the gap between high and lower registers, with expletive ni no on the rise in high register texts such as philosophical ones, but also in less formal documents of experience writers. And this rise predates the acceptance by normative grammarians. In fact, official acceptance could be a consequence rather than a cause of the rise of expletive no. By contrast, in texts of unexperienced writers, expletive no with avant que remains a minor infrequent variant and the same holds for spoken French in the 20th century. So despite claims to the contrary, no semantic or pragmatic values associated, in my opinion, to expletive no and before clauses, which makes French different from Italian, but fr uh, it has increasingly gained prestige, you know, which makes it different from German. So overall, there have been, has been an evolution from a contextually constrained variability <coughs> to an increasingly free variation and concomitant refunctionalization of expletive no as a stylistic variable. And this might be, then be an instance, yet another instance, of increasing, increasing diglossic tendencies and increasing upstand between high and low registers in modern French. Thank you very much. <coughs>
Exactly. Um, I, I fully agree with you. Um, I would have to look uh, um, more closely at uh, the history of uh, German. I think in middle high German there have been um, many cases of expletive negation which are not found any longer. You might know more about this, or the, the, the Germanic specialist might know more about it. Uh, in the Nibelungenlied there have been cases with expletive um, negation in, in comparative clauses. And, and about everything you find uh, for French and, and for medieval French. And then if you look in, in, in traditional works such as Behagel's uh, Deutsche Grammatik, he always says um, um, there have been uh, um, claims uh, according to which this would be an instance of uh, interference or a card from French, from, from medieval French. But then and, and Behagel is always uh, um, eager to state but in the end, this may have reinforced a tendency which was there before. So he's very skeptical about contact explanation for this in German. But it would be interesting. I, I, I don't know whether there's a, a full range, exhaustive study of uh, the history of expletive negation in German. Lowering. But not uh -huh. quite uh -huh. low enough uh -huh. to disappear. So uh -huh. like, the long existence at low frequency, people will start to wonder what it is. And then you get this uptake uh, in the expletive negation. It's like, we have it, let's do something with it. Uh -huh. I, don't know, I, I don't know if you can find it uh -huh. useful. Um, so, uh -huh. I, but actually, I think uh, you can show that it becomes, uh, it takes on some kind of lyrical function. So it's, it's ah, okay. why unexpected. We talk about it. Ah, okay. Interesting. That would be a case of acceptation. Yeah, yes. exactly, exactly. Yeah. I was going to, to put this on the slide, but there are <laughs> <laughs> too many things on the slide. Uh, thanks a lot, very nice story. Uh, uh, just one, um, uh, another language that would be interesting to look at is Catalan, uh -huh. where you have no and you have also no pas mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as expletive uh, forms with diatopic, stylistic, mm -hmm. don't know what kind oh. of difference. <coughs> um, but yeah, there, there's a uh, recent work um, on this. Um, it, it's the, what's the license in conjunctions? It's not before, it's uh, kind of until um, birth. Uh, um, and, and there, it doesn't seem, at least according to the authors I've been able to consult, um, it doesn't seem to be um, genuinely free variation in, mm -hmm. in, 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 in semantic and pragmatic uh, respects. Uh, on, on, on the the form of the negation, I think Anne's point is really good, uh, but we have also to take into account that fa on its own can be used as an expletive, although mm -hmm. not in the eye registers. I mean, in, uh, you find it; it's not super frequent, but it exists. I mean, there's also, of course, the, uh, for instance, in the history of language, you see that uh, in certain clauses you use uh, the new negator uh, in expletive context, mm -hmm. and in some you use the old one. Okay. Uh -huh. So I think that that's maybe also something to look at if you if you wanted to yeah. send the references to the English. Oh, thank you, right. the, uh, uh, I think not all expletive contexts are the same. Yeah, it's a, it's, no, it's a subset. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's Draco's point. Yeah. On old I German, there is apparently, if I remember the address correctly, one example in Tetsia or something mm -hmm. like that that everybody feels forced mm -hmm. to cite, but there's nothing else. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what your talk made me think about is it would be interesting to, because of, of these avant and uh, kind and so on, because of these very central uh, licensors, it would be interesting to look cross linguistically at the reading of uh, complementizers that have a negative import, like Greek min. Uh, uh -huh. and or Latin, timio ne venias. So, you know, because <coughs> they're into the it, it made me think of that. And you might find an overlap between the readings of the negative, uh, mm. inherently negative complementizers mm. and the expletive context. So yes, yes. Very nice but but the, the, the hard task is to spell out the details of the evolution from Timio ne Venus uh, via the, the, the old French type ne peut mourir n'en pleurt, for instance. Uh, he couldn't prevent from, from weeping. Um, to the que ne type. 
So, and, and there's recent work done on this. Uh, but again, um, so in my view, the, the, the mu much work on expletive negation is driven by an inherent desire to reject the yeah. hypothesis yeah. of free variation. And my way would be in order to, to state that uh, free variation is there, uh, and it can, and to the extent that uh, the, the variant is in free variation, it can be refunctionalized for stylistic or register differentiation purposes. Uh, I look into the grand corpus des grammaires françaises and the prescribed, mm -hmm. pres prescribed, prescribed uh -huh. side of things. Uh -huh. And in um, in, uh, in uh, César du uh, Marseille work in the middle of the 18th century, he talk about, uh, if I, I can read the quote, uh, c'est la pensée habituelle de celui qui parle qui attire cette négation. Uh, mon esprit tourné vers la négation la met dans ce discours. <laughs> <laughs> So there is definitely something there uh, in the classical French uh, mm -hmm. grammar studies. Right. They, they, yeah, they, they see that there is something oriented mm -hmm. toward negation that, that cannot be accomplished fully. And mm -hmm. I do think that also Damore de Fichon has some pages yeah, on yeah. the matter. Yeah. That's what last year you think about it? I haven't found anything. Uh, we should uh, ask uh, one year's planet on this. I'm sorry, sorry. One of the remarks, uh, isn't Bojla uh, saying something about that? I don't think so. I was, no. I was, just, I was just, just looking at yeah, it. Yeah, so I, can, uh, I couldn't find um, it. But it's because it's a typical phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. but Bojla uh, is quiet. The before yes. clause is perhaps not at that time. I think yeah, yeah, probably not. I think it's not, it's not so salient. Yeah, uh, I think so. It will be a, a bit later on. It that's why that's it. When you get the lots of comments is towards the end of the 18th century, the people like Bowie and then Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, uh, before I would plunge into negation once again, I'd like to just briefly talk to you a little bit about the antecedents of this project. Because when we started uh, working on these topics, first our approach was uh, inspired by historical sociolinguistics research. So we tried to build a corpus of text that would represent informal spoken language as closely as it's possible in a diachronic context. And then we, of course, started to extend it and also carried out research on the basis of that corpus. And that those, the, those items were both quantitative and qualitative in nature. Uh, but the thing is that when, uh, we, uh, when we did uh, random comparisons with other text types, 
uh, all of a sudden it occurred that what we found in a relatively large corpus, I mean, it's relatively large in a Hungarian context, though, uh, those weren't quite always valid for other text types. Uh, and this, this result is not very surprising in itself, uh, but it was the pattern that was uh, uh, unexpected so that we also had this starting point that innovation starts out in mostly in informal spoken conversation. And so we thought that those texts uh, that represent this variant would be more innovative in, in a sense. Uh, but then this was not necessarily the case. And I would like to show you my colleague's findings that were particularly uh, relevant in this sense. Uh, she looked at uh, a form uh, at two variants of relative pronouns. This is one example of those. And then the blue bars represent uh, the old variant, the, ra the green one, the new variant. And she compared two periods. And it turned out that in her first uh, period, actually it were, were the Bible translations that were more in, most innovative, which was kind of striking. And then in her second period, there were no more Bible translations from that, those, the, that period. Uh, but it seems to be the case that uh, the, both the other informal and formal text types just caught up with the Bibles by that time. And so uh, she called attention to the importance of looking at Bible translations as a, a text type of a typical re receiver register. Because in this period, this was the type of text that could get also to the illiterate people. So, uh, most of the people couldn't read at this time, but they could listen to these texts uh, during the sermons. So in that sense, as a receiver register, it could have an effect on the diffusion of the new form. So that was kind of an impetus for us to launch into this new project. But first, of course, we started to look at parallels to see if uh, we could really be expe expected to find something. And then we did find such unexpected patterns uh, of register variation in other languages, and that's how we uh, dared to start this new project. Uh, and this is variation in Middle Hungarian, a register perspective. Uh, and in this project, we also look at different morphosyntactic and pragmatic phenomena. Uh, but now, a register is our main independent variable. And so to do this, uh, we, we are building a corpus of Middle Hungarian memoirs and dramas. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the next session among the flash talks. And now I will focus on two variants of negation. Uh, but I'm very, very grateful for the organizers of this conference. It's, it's just so inspiring to be here because it's just right at the heart of our project too. Uh, so I'll talk very briefly about the variants and their history, and then I'll introduce my uh, hypothesis. I'll talk a little bit about methods and then I will show you the independent variables one by one in a monofactorial setting, and then all of them combined. Uh, and I'll try to draw some conclusions, and I'll try to be in time, but that's not something I usually manage, so I'll <laughs> try my best. So just very briefly about Hungarian, I'm going to talk about, does this work? Anyhow, Middle Hungarian. Uh, because that's the first period when we can uh, co compare registers. So all our documents from Old Hungarian represent one very formal register that's, that is church language. So Middle Hungarian, we have more varied text types, and that's where we can start this kind of investigation. And uh, uh, the de dependent variant surfaces as two different word order patterns in negation, and that can only be investigated in sentences uh, uh, that are, well, of course, negative on the one hand, but uh, that have a so-called verbal modifier in them. So what you have to look for, the difference is that in one of the variants, the verbal modifier precedes the negated verb, and the other, in the other variant, it comes after it. Uh, and actually, this difference uh, indicates a structural difference between these two kind of uh, negative patterns. So in the first case, in the adjunction-based variant, uh, it's assumed that the negative element is left adjoined to the verb in a low structural position in the sentence. Whereas in the second variant, uh, actually neg the negative element is inserted in a high functional position in a negative phrase. And from this posi position, it elicits movement of the verb. So the verb moves higher, and then the particle stays behind. And so, so that's the difference between these two. 
And the other thing is that the first variant, which, which is in blue, this uh, junction-based variant, this is uh, something that Hungarian inherited from proto ugric So this is a very, very old pattern. The second one uh, is a proto, probably a proto-Hungarian innovation. It's still very old, though. So these two variants have coexisted ever since Hungarian is documented. But the, the second one is relatively younger still. OK. And there are many types of verbal modifiers, but I will uh, look uh, at only one type, the most frequent type, and that's the verbal particle in this case. OK, so the, the, there is this long-standing uh, coexistence of these two patterns, but that can be divided into three periods. In the first long period, there is stable variation, but the, with the predominance of this A, this older variant. Then comes the 19th century and the radical frequency change. And then uh, ever since the 20th century, we have stable variation, but this time with the predominance of the M variant. So these two graphs just show you how this change took place during the 19th century. Uh, and so what now comparing the, the period before the change and the period after the change. Uh, so if you look at the modern Hungarian pie, you see that there's only a very small slice of this older negation. And it appears in two very different functions. Uh, in some contexts, it's emphatic negation. In other contexts, it's uh, uh, expletive or pleonastic negation. And I think that's also a case of acceptation in Hungarian as well. Uh, but in the case of uh, Middle Hungarian, we can be fairly certain that this old variant couldn't be marked in any sense because it was just so frequent. Uh, and we can't be certain about the function, the pragmatic function of the other variant uh, but I have this hunch that that could be, at that time, emphatic negation. And I know that this is a very, very difficult thing to prove. I have several ideas how to do that, but it would take us far from, the, from this today's talk, but we can return to it. Uh, and so uh, my earlier results is that uh, when I investigated this uh, older corpus of informal language use, it seemed to be the case that external factors, like standard sociolinguistic factors, didn't play a role at all in the distribution. So we got the same data, irrespective of social status, gender, or set period, or dialect. So basically, it was a quite a homogeneous data set. And then when I looked at this very influential Bible translation, then it turned out that uh, this new variant was much more frequent in that source for some unknown reason. But then again, before postulating that, okay, then Bible translations again are innovative, I looked at another type of religious text. These were written by the very influential cantor reformer, uh, Peter Pansman, and in his text, there were hardly any instances of this newer variant, so this is how it appeared. Uh, so, there is this, then, then this uh, hypothesis is in fact not quite vague, but what I thought that in the, in the case of these variants, uh, they have some pragmatic difference between them. And then, so this is not a structural innovation, that's just a shift in the distribution of the patterns. And because of this pragmatically based uh, difference, perhaps uh, those genres that belong to a more formal register, they give just somehow more space to the individual, perhaps idiosyncratic features of the authors because they are particularly motivated to use a language that they think will be effective and somehow be, will stay with their readers or listeners. So, so I was expecting to find more author-based variation in the formal registers than in the informal registers. And this is what I'm going to focus on now. Uh, so I compared uh, six text types, witness depositions, private letters, drama memoirs, religious prose, and Bible translations. And then I, I assigned these kind of standard registered features to them because uh, I didn't only want to look at the text types, I, also, I was also interested in whether there would be like clusters on the basis of these features, register-based features. Here are the technical details on how many data I had and how I got them. Uh, but then this uh, plot will make it much more visible that 
uh, one problem with my data is that the, these subcorpora, these text types, are very unevenly represented. So you can see that the uh, bars uh, representing, oh, it's not very visible, okay. So letter and trial, those are the fat ones because I had the most of the data from those. And the, those are all white also. And basically what's behind this plot is a chi-squared test, chi -square test. So in those bars where there are no uh, colors, that indicates that the distribution of the two variants in that given text type doesn't differ significantly from the distribution in the entirety of those texts. So in those cases, the given uh, level of the variable seems to play no role. But then in the case of Bible translations, memoirs, and religious prose, where you see some colors, that means that there's some kind of difference uh, as opposed to the general uh, average on, of the whole of these texts. And blue indicates that there is something more than expected. So there is more of this new variant in Bible translations and memoirs. And uh, red means that there's less. So actually there is less of this variant in religious prose. Uh, and I also tried to make those clusters and actually I couldn't find any patterns on the basis of those features. And basically this clustering just sh shows you uh, what you saw before, that there are, there are those two that use this M variant a little bit more frequently than those that use it a little bit less frequently. But I wouldn't go uh, long on describing this because actually both of these charts were a little bit misleading. Because even though uh, these external factors don't seem to influence the distribution of these two variants, there are language internal factors that do seem to play a role, and so they also need to be taken into account. One of these is close type, uh, and I think it has to do something like with the notions of assertion and uh, presupposition or foregrounding and backgrounding. So I think it's more likely to find this M variant uh, in foregrounded or asserted clauses and less likely to find it in backgrounded. And then the presence or absence of negative pronoun. So the, the two features uh, that, are, that favor the appearance of this M variant uh, is main clauses and clauses similar to that in a pragmatic sense and the absence of negative pronoun. So this shows you the effect of close type. And what it shows is that main clauses use more of this M variant and less of the other, the older variant, whereas there is hardly any variation, for instance, in conditional clauses. And there's basically no variation in until clauses. And until clauses are a context for expletive negation. And I think that's why we don't have any variation there. Uh, the presence of negative pronoun doesn't seem to be that dramatic, but it will have to be taken into account at a later point. And so now let's zoom on authors, finally. Although in some of the cases, those were like this type of authors, because in the case of trials, we don't really have authors. We have witnesses and we have scribes. So in that case, I substituted the category author with the category dialect. So in that sense, it's not perfectly comparable, but still, this is the best, next best thing, okay. I'll be soon done. So I'll show you the results of two comparisons. In the first of these, all close types are included. In the second, the focus is only on main clauses, so in the environment which, which is more uh, towards this M variant. So this is all close types. And then in the first line, you see the registers that are speech related. And in the second line, you see those uh, registers that are not speech related. And so what I think uh, is quite visible is that uh, non-speech related texts are more colorful so, colorful, so there's more variation going on in these. There is one obvious exception in trials, that's a particular dialect. And that's also an interesting <coughs> story, but in that case, I think there's a confounding variable at play. So again, this is something I don't have time now to go into, but we can return to that in the Q&A section. And so if we go on now to main clauses, so a more homogeneous data set in this sense, then what we see is that variation almost disappears uh, from speech-related uh, texts, but it's still there uh, in the non-speech-related uh, part. 
so we find it in both in Bibles and religious prose, but the, the differences are different themselves. So you cannot say that uh, this uh, text type prefers this variant and the other prefers that variant. There are differences between the authors. So this seems to be their individual uh, preference. And before I would show you finally the integrated results, so this all in one, I would like to just go zoom on this one, religious prose. So the thing is, the problem with this uh, skewed data set that I have a lot of data from this Cardinal Pazman, and that, that's why we have uh, both, uh, both the other guys with blue, uh, because actually uh, he, Pazman used uh, this new variant in so, little, so few cases that compared to that, all of them are like more using it more frequently. But if you compare the two edges, uh, then what we see is a slight increase in the M variant. And I think that's basically before this influential Bible translation and after this influential Bible translation, because these are both Protestant preachers uh, at the two edges. But the first was before this uh, uh, Protestant <laughs> translation, and the second was after, and this uh, other guy, he also published a revised version of this very influential Bible translation, so maybe he just adopted this pattern of usage as well. And so now, this all-in-one approach, so author and a sentence type and negative pronoun, and what we will see on these charts is that the, the first uh, uh, mode uh, in which there is this, both these people split is author. So there, in the case of Bible translations, there are two authors who don't use very much this M variant, and there are these two authors who use it somewhat more frequently. But then the second branching node, that's already sentence type in both cases. So we have that environment that kind of favors uh, the M variant a little bit more. And then if we go to uh, those authors on the left-hand side who favor the new variant more, then negative pronouns features again as a factor. So basically, Carly, so the author of this very, very influential Bible translation, used uh, this M variant already over 60% of the mm -hmm. cases in those environments where there was a main clause or a clause similar to that in this respect, and there was no negative pronoun. And now if we look at uh, this other the religious prose, and Oh, yeah, 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 sure. So it's really something like right wing and left wing. It's like Catholic and Protestant or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but then Pazman Peter, who, who was an influential Catholic person, hardly uses uh, this new variant. So it's a, a branching node on its own. But then if we go on, then the next branching node is again sentence type. And then if we go down, uh, then it's only, in this case, it's only main clauses that form a separate cluster. But in that case, uh, it's again uh, in the absence of negative pronouns uh, and the M variant frequency rises. And actually, Saint Simona, whose work uh, follows the addition of this Bible translation, it's again above 60%. So the majority of the cases, and it's almost the same percentage. So ultimately, I think there is some slight uh, reinforcement to this uh, proposal that speech-related registers in this uh, particular instance seem to be more homogeneous. Homogeneous? So uh, authors or authors within a register do not differ significantly from each other. As opposed to this, there is uh, this author-based variation in Bible translations and religious prose. And then I think that if my hunch is correct in the M variant being more emphatic, then the motivation for this can be even similar to what they found with the self-reflexive pronouns in early modern English. Then in that case, religious uh, so sermons and actually statues uh, were the first to adopt and distribute these new forms. And in the case of uh, sermons, the author uh, had this explanation that it's, it's related to the original intensifying uh, function of the self pronouns, and actually, what the authors emphasize is that the things they write about is important. So that anything, uh, the, so I quote this: anything done by Christ is a remarkable act. Mm -hmm. 
And so they started to use self pronouns even more frequently, and that could lead change. My practical task for the future is to balance the size of the subcorpora. And in some cases it's possible, but in the case of religious prose, it will be very, very difficult because of the form of the text that now I have them in. So, so that will require a lot of work. And the question that, that buggers me the most and I'm most interested in is it's something that still remains open. Can it be the case that uh, this idiosyncratic pattern in a highly influential source uh, basically led to a large scale change uh, two centuries later by like going down so as an instance of uh, change from above. Well, uh, I need to acknowledge the support of this organization and here are the references and sources and thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> There was a lot of change in this respect. Uh -huh. So when protest okay, until <laughs> <laughs> so actually there was a point when Hungary could could be an entirely Protestant country, and there came this uh, Pazman, uh, right, Cardinal right. Pazman, and he was I very influential. Think that's an entirely plausible hypothesis. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Catholic Bible, the, the only Catholic Bible translation uh, appeared later, and it wasn't. It just wasn't that influential although it, it followed the regular pattern. It, it wasn't included in these slides. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to, uh, to support you. That's lovely. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, Could I, I get some references? I because I can give you the literature so you can look it up because yeah. it, it seems um, kind of very similar to that. Yeah. Well, oh, thank you. So at this year's ICH, of, it was already last year's ICH, of, I heard someone saying that I don't believe in change from above. And uh, thank you for yeah. the references. No, I mean, in the case of German, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, quite, it's quite clear. It's, uh, it's So that's kind of a marker then, yeah. social marker. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm curious if you looked for or noticed any internal variation in the Bible register fantasy variation. It's a long enough text, and if it's true that speech attributed to Christ or acts you know, described surrounding Christ might be treated mm -hmm. differently somehow, or if there's any kind of... Uh, Unfortunately, I didn't distinguish those parts. It's a it's a great idea, though. Thank you. So. Yeah. Uh, just in order to support what was said, uh, previously on uh, concerning uh, the influence uh, you said from above, but it's more. Uh, I would rather talk about the uh, identity marker, mm -hmm. uh, and it has been explored in uh, on a phonetic evolution in. Uh, yeah, in that's Dutch, true. Uh, where, for instance, between house and house, mouse and mouse, uh, mouse and moose. Oh, moose. I'm not fluent in yeah, yeah, yeah. English, uh, Dutch. But uh, um, the, the, the line, the division, the political division between uh, parties uh, was, was reflected in, uh, in the pronunciation, which was adopted in order to, to have a, a clear identity marker and not be killed, for instance, in the <laughs> Yeah, the only thing that bothers me in this case is that this Bible translation was first published at the end of the 16th century, but this entire change that's that's quite dramatic that went uh, that went, went through in the 19th century. That so there's a relatively large time gap between that. But so that. Sources and you know it's existed throughout history, so mm -hmm. 
might just have gone on the ground. Yeah, but and the I, I like the Protestant Catholic story because for French, Calvin sermons mm -hmm. are really the most less conservatives. And I don't know if you'd have to compare with the uh, Catholic sermons, but mm -hmm. I would guess that they're much more conservative. But mm -hmm. yeah, just an idea. Okay. Yeah, the only thing that I would like to reflect on this quickly is that, yeah, it would be a sound assumption that it was somewhere there lurking among people, they used it, and then it appeared later in formal speech. But actually, the trials and letters, those are from Middle Hungarian, so right before this change, and there is no variation. So, and, you know, that is from witness deposits and witch trials, so this is as close to informal spoken language as we can get, and we have this 15% versus 85% distribution. So it might be there, but I just can't uh, lay my hands on it because the data don't confirm, confirm it. Okay. Yeah. Let's thank the speakers unless there are other questions. Thank you again. There is a little some coffee left, but I think if you want espresso, you need to go upstairs. And there are lots of sweets and juices. Oh, yeah, I was just wondering if you need help. Oh, no, no, this is not a problem at all. Put up in your talk, and I forgot to show you the 10 minute uh, part. Yeah, it was extremely interesting. You were probably your client. Yeah, I was reading. Uh, I wanted to ask you if uh, there's a uh, movement variation that like you see is reflected in other contexts uh, than the nation. So, are there other contexts in which you see the movement uh, that is triggered by other things that are not the nation? Okay, so it's the only thing that changed, it's the only thing, because it could have been interesting for other things changed. If you could have investigated also those, they go together, but yeah, they go
For some reason, well, those places are just those patterns together, yeah. and then this is the middle okay. region which complements yeah. and then the closes, yeah. and then there are conditionals, and this is the category of anti So you see, it's left out of the yeah. change. Yeah. Yeah. And all those, they, they started a different way, but then they all the catch all yeah. by the end. But they are still, they are still, apparently, they are still in the, in the, in the, and now yeah, for, 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 yeah, for some reason, yeah. 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 different subordinate forces can have different status, so they can be closer to integrating into the main course or be a variant to that. For instance, in French, you have temporal forces which behave in Yeah, I don't remember how yeah, 
of features are rare and rare. That sounds better. Even some other places can be for Yeah, it depends on the case. Yeah, but then that involves a lot of subjectivity and data. And I would like to say that I would like to say that.
Yes, uh, I will attack this new genre, uh, which is the flash presentations. And I'm going to talk today about uh, person in no sentences in French text from 
14th to 16th century with mostly methodological aims, so to demonstrate the relevance on the, of the represented speech perspective in French negation studies and that of combining text type heterogeneous and homogeneous corpora. So the corpora I'm going to use is BFM 19, so small disclaimer in the abstract it was BFM 22, but I had some technical issues, so it will be the previous version. Um, BFM 19, which is a text type heterogeneous corpora, uh, corpus with texts from fiction, religious, historical, didactical, law, etc. The Mikkel preview, or at least its part up until 60th century, uh, which are law texts uh, that contain trial proceedings on one hand and other legal texts on the other hand. And finally, the 30th to 16th century part of Condé, which contain coutume, so Normandy laws. Um, so, I'm going throughout the talk, I'm going to speak about three types of use of personne, the noun use, as in barbare est appelé la personne qui ne naît ne grec ne latin, we call barbarian a person who is neither Greek nor Latin, and the indefinite pronoun use, which can be either MPI, as in sans ce que personne en sur rien, or N-word use, and that will be our main focus. So, a nurse sentence where personne has no determiner or modifier, such as, mais que tu m'assures que personne ne passera la rivière que toi, uh, but I want you to assure me that nobody crosses the river but you. So, I have to say that a starting point uh, for this reflection was our interest towards the noun use and the lexical semantics of the noun use of person in BFM 19. Uh, so, according to uh, our recent paper, person in uh, me medieval French is a long use from medieval Latin texts, and there are three main meanings, a uh, clerk of a high rank, one of the hypotheses of the Trinity, and human being. And as you can see in the table, in the uh, 12th century, uh, it is used mostly in the two religious meanings, whereas from the 30th century, it starts to be used mostly to design, to refer to human being in general. And um, from that point of view, it becomes a general human noun. So what is a general human noun? It is a shell noun that refers to human being in general without specifying any supplemental biological or social characteristic, and that tends to be grammaticalized over time towards pronouns. So that is why, uh, basically, I also saw that in BFM 19 there were some occurrences of person probably grammaticalized towards the N-word, and um, I tried to figure out why they are here and how they work. So, first of all, I have to say that I probably uh, spotted one example of what we can consider as bridging context uh, for this use in the BFM 19. So here are, we have three sentences from the same uh, extract of a trial proceeding where a thief explains how he, um, how he pulled out the three thefts. And so at the beginning we have uh, n'avait personne quelconque. So we have, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. I forgot. Okay, so, n'avait personne quelconque. We have quelconque as modifier that um, pulls out the indefinite value. And after that, we have in the same paragraph, we have already auquel okay, n'avait personne, and then again, il n'avait personne. So, probably, um, we see those contexts where this um, modifier is no longer mandatory. and. Yes, yeah, so that was a, an interesting example uh, that is present in BFM 19. Um, yes, so, well, as all you know, the evolution of the French negative system is often described as a classic case of the Jespersen cycle. Uh, so the N-word set is starting to form during the medieval French period, so we have different items such as uh, pro, um, disemanticized or pronominalized nouns as pas, gout, or rien, pronouns and determiners as nul and aucun, adverbs as onc, uh, etc. And as for personne, according to the Trésor de la langue française, it appears rather late comparatively to other N word items, so in late 13th, early 14th century. At the same time, if we 
look to the Nikos dictionary of the very beginning of 17th century. So here you have uh, the whole article that is dedicated to the art and person, and you can see that uh, the description of the N word used, both preverbal pre and postverbal, occupies half of the paper. So I think that it is a sign that by that time the use of person as N word is already important enough for Nicole to include it extensively uh, in the paper. So, what happens in between? In the BFM 19, we have only 16 occurrences in 14th century and 14 occurrences in 15th century. So, it represents overall 2 and 2.5% two and of all the uses of person um, <coughs> in this corpus. As for N NPI, um, I don't have time to speak about it now, but you see that data is even more scarce. Uh, only two occurrences in 14th century and three in 15th century. And I must say that the scarcity of data on personnes and word in Middle French has been noted by L'Arrivée and Calel on a um, remission letters corpus. So, um, it seemed important to compare the use of personnes and word with the use of its concurrents, nul and aucun. So, nul is used as N word from the earliest French text and as NPI2. As for aucun, from old French, it is used mostly as positive indefinite. And then from late 30th, uh, it, is, it also starts to use as NPI and in nurse sentences. At the same time, according to Inum, um, well, it was a work on an uh, administrative prose corpus, uh, and according to his results, Aucun progressively replaces nul first as NPR, then as N-word during that period, and nul disappears from speech uh, during the 40th century. So, given all that, if we compare the data on person and nul on account of BFM 19, we can see that the N-word use of person and aucun is relatively comparable, but at the same time, the overall use as indefinite pronoun is really uh, unequal. So we have only 18 occurrences of person, 18 and 17, and as you can see, the use of nul and aucun as indefinite pronoun is much more frequent in BFM 19. So we tried to figure out the specificity of personas and word in BFM 19, and we were searching for different patterns. So we tested some criteria, such as the syntactic function, but it could be preverbal or postverbal. The textile distribution, there were slightly more examples in literature, but they were also different other text types. The verse prose uh, opposition didn't do anything. Um, Either. So we figured out that the data was too scarce for clear patterns, and that's where we switched to Mikkel. So uh, in our period, we have nine trial proceedings. So the the texts where the words of the witnesses and the accused are reported, and three law texts. And there we had overall 289 occurrences of person, and. 12 occurrences of N-word use, with the earliest in uh, the Jeanne d'Arc's trial, but all of them appeared in what we can call the represented speech. So the text segments that represent oral speech, we in, um, understand it in a broad sense of not only direct but also indirect speech, especially when speaking about trials, because basically those are the words of the accused and the witnesses. And so, well, we have examples as this one, à quoi elle répondit, de sa propre volonté, et que personne ne l'avait compelé à ce. So, to which she answered, by her own will, and that nobody had forced her into that. So, we have like a case of mix of a direct and indirect speech here. And all of the examples of N-word use of personne appeared in those kind of um, occurrences, those kind of examples. So at this point, I have to say that according to Brian Donaldson's study of nurse sentences with and without parmi Guttenon French, more innovative variants tended to appear more frequently in represented speech. So if we compare the use of person, nul, and aucun in Mikkel um, in, um, in relation with uh, the use of uh, reported speech, uh, represented speech, we see that in the first texts, we only have nul. Uh, even in the text where we have represented speech, well, 
with uh, a small reserve that we have angular normals, and maybe there can be some difference um, uh, related with that. But from 15th century, um, but for one example of text, every time we have represented speech, we will also have personne, and we will not have nul. As for aucun, it can appear in both, even though it is also rather rare, so it's difficult to figure out what is Aucun's place uh, here. So we figured that it was really interesting. Uh, as for, very quickly, as for Condé, there was only one text where we uh, found personas uh, and word, and there were 30, uh, 335 overall occurrences of person, and only three of N word, whereas nul was still much more frequent. So, if we go back to BFM 19, we can um, see that the bridging context we were talking earlier about was also in represented speech, that in 14th century we had none of 16 occurrences in represented speech, and in 15th century we had only five occurrences in represented speech, but seven occurrences came from Memoir by Philippe de Comines, which is known to be a text marked by orality. So according to Blanchard, it has a modern physiognomy of the sentence. So if we summarize the data from three corpora, from 14th to 16th century, and uh, personas n-word is less frequent than Newland account, but stable, and is most likely to appear in represented speech and in texts marked by orality. So, we may suppose that personas and word did emerge in late 30th, early 40th century in speech, but until mid 16th century, it was well spread in speech, but still very rare in written texts. So, uh, if we go back if we consider that nude disappears from speech in 40th century, and if we consider the results of Capot on contemporary French, according to whom personne is uh, more uh, representative of the, of the communicative proximity and nul of communicative distance, uh, we can see so that on that continuum between proximity and distance, Person is more on the left and nul is more on the right, and that probably the discrimination started already in Middle French, actually. Uh, as for person and account, <coughs> it is to be further investigated on, on other corpora and in a larger diachronic. So as for the overall conclusions, we, uh, our study showed that innovative negative construction, person in the sentence, was more likely to appear in represented speech, so it confirms the relevance of Donaldson observation and more generally of the represented speech perspective. And we also can say that the text type heterogeneous BFM19 allowed us to identify the phenomenon, whilst the text type homogeneous Mikkel and Condé allowed us to understand its specificity. So it shows the relevance of combining text type heterogeneous and homogeneous corpora data in diachronical studies. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> It's not yeah. Right. Because I, I found that very interesting when you are comparing uh, the two Janda texts, yeah. Procé and the mm -hmm. Because Procé is like the, the minions of the trial. Exactly. So we, the, we try to catch the, the speech from Janda as close as it could be in this mm -hmm. kind of text. But rehabilitation is another instance when we try to uh, better fit the, the trial narration of things and so that there is a transformation in the matter of, of the direct speech. And uh, the second question I ask is when you are looking for the four instances of person in procession that mm -hmm. it is from Jean herself or from the, uh, the judge? You know? Yes, it was mostly from herself. It was it her words that were transcribed, yes. Okay, so, so it, it could really be a trace of of her personal speech? Yeah. No, it's difficult to say because, uh, well, once again, the data is scarce, and at the same time, it is not the only text that we see it in. So we also have it in Roche Guillon and later. So 
honestly, I, I don't remember. Yeah, so we have only four occurrences. Um, I'm not sure that we can really attribute it to, to her personal yeah. style. Um, once again, it's not that exceptional. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, maybe there is also, that's what you're saying about the rehabilitation, the author is not the same. So yeah. in rehabilitation, it's, more, it's like more from above once again, whereas when it's her speech is more like um, um, genuine. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. And, and we, do, we do spot some interferences in, in this text, in Procé, uh, from Latin, actually. Mm. Because yeah. the judges seem to be try to imitate something of Latin speech or to translate mm -hmm. in French some Latin structure. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, I've smuggled myself into the program, but in a short <laughs> format. So uh, I want to tell you about uh, current work uh, on uh, null subjects. Um, so the context is that uh, at a time where I started looking at the history of French, because I was bored with contemporary French, um, I worked with a young man to be sure that my interpretation was uh, of old French made any sense, and we made the claim, you know, such was the curve of, of loss of null <coughs> subjects by 1200. We made the claim that you know, this is in the vernacular or something that disappears, and Barbara Vance says quite reasonably that, uh, well, you still do find null subjects in, in null French text, so, you know, you're full of shit. Um, <laughs> Barbara did not say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the question is, does Middle French still have null subjects? And uh, are they the same type as Old French? Because there's a debate about this, whether uh, Middle French becomes a partial null subject language. Uh, we should be able to answer these questions by looking at the narrative legal text that we've assembled through uh, the last uh, eight, seven or eight years, but of course uh, they present a particular challenge that they include mostly third person uh, on the whole. Um, so the context is uh, about null subject in French is that we have uh, an old French system where uh, you have licensing by V2 configurations, uh, mostly in main clauses, and more frequent with third persons, where first and second actually anchorage subject expression. And I don't think that paradox has been uh, underlined uh, as much as it should have. 
you get to a period where actually the person, second, first and second, Anchorage Null, it seems, so it is claimed by illustrious authors, some of them here, uh, and it's found in subordinates as well, and embedded, and it's got wider licensing conditions than just V2. Um, of course, these illustrious studies have been elaborated mostly uh, from one textual type, that is mostly uh, Roman de Chevalerie. So the research questions I would like to evoke here are, uh, well, is null French uh, a null subject language? Is it a partial null subject language? And I'm looking at the overall rate of use of null subjects, the rate of use in subordinates, and the rate of use of rich agreement, persons, first, second, plural, but where you can hear the distinct person on the verb and the expletive third person uh, code pronoun, rate of use. Um, this slide um, goes back to a discussion uh, about uh, that we had yesterday about text heterogeneity, where the procedure texts are concerned, that come from Mikkel. The, the 1578 in bold does seem to evidence partial null subject elements, but it's only in the parts of the text that are cited from the King of France making grand declarations. Mm -hmm. The other parts do not have this feature of partial null subject. In letters, there's, we have two corpora, uh, the Anglo-Norman, the Destutville, which uh, was uh, put online years ago by Mathieu, uh, and only the 1500s uh, collection as signs of partial null subject. Among the sermons, Sully and Calvin are just straight, just follow the old French uh, system of V2 licensing, essentially, with Calvin having only a few occurrence of fairly formulaic stuff. But Gerson in 1400 has got the partial null subject system, uh, to a degree, or traces of it. And in Romance, uh, you only get the 1500 text, which has this system, but not the other two. So uh, I've gone back to the text in bold that evidence uh, some elements of uh, higher <coughs> rates of use of null subject with uh, the rich agreement grammatical persons and use in subordinates. And <coughs> I've um, painstakingly uh, manually um, assessed the uh, rates of null and the context of null. Um, this is the slide that you want to take a photo of if you're interested in the subject because it, it summarizes basically uh, what is going on here. So what you see if you take a minute to, to look at the slide is there is a connection between higher rate of use, overuse and subordinate, and V1 uses. I mean a fairly close connection in those texts. Uh, between these three properties. So, to take one example from sermons, you have uh, an over, um, some overuse of first person uh, plural and an overuse of expletives. Uh, you have an overuse of insubordinate definitely for expletives, not so conclusive for the others. And uh, you have V1 uh, use for expletives, um, so for null expletives. So you have a connection between these three properties, but this connection is not always strong. So for instance, expletives in uh, Romance, uh, 16th century, Roman Chevalerie, um, you, don't have a strong, you don't have the strongest connection because you have overuse and subordinate, higher rate of use, but not V1 necessarily. Um, so there seems to be some kind of connection, but it is nonetheless a loose one. Um, I'm not going to walk you through the results, but I want to underline that um, if you're interested, it's a nice collection of Norman letters with some letters from working class folks, so uh, uh, um, people who repair the castle and so on. Sadly, there's not that much sociolinguistic differentiation in letters. Um, so I'm going to jump on that. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, sociolinguistic conclusions or, or points for consideration. 
Uh, we have to take into account the uh, sociolinguistic status of the data for a diglossic language like French. Maybe for Norwegian you don't have to because Norwegian people write the way they speak. Or, uh, but for French, definitely, we need to calibrate the data and to uh, tri triangulate across types of text. And that's the answer to or that's my answer to uh, Wendy's point yesterday. She said, well, what's the point of looking at only one type of text because the type of text can change through time? And indeed, I agree. We've seen that. We've seen in our work uh, that it does. Uh, but of course, the answer is to look at triangulate different monogeneric corpora. And uh, we've done that in the paper on, on Bear nouns uh, with Mathieu published recently and where we, by comparing different, uh, different te text types, we can see that some texts are outliers. So you know, it, they, they can't be representative really um, of, of the phenomenon. They're compared to other text types and to their own text type, they're uh, out of bounds as it were. So we have to care about the sociolinguistic uh, status of the data. Um, while a uh, null subject does not seem to be sensitive to register in the data I've looked at, but I know that Lena has uh, found nice uh, proofs that uh, there might be such a sensitivity. And what I haven't found, which I was expecting, was to be a difference in working class versus upper class writers in the Estudville letters. As for null subjects, I haven't found it. Um, partial null subject was probably a uh, written convention in Middle French, so overuse with first, second, plural, uh, overuse in V1 subordinates. And why do I say this? Well, for the following reasons. Uh, the overuse of second plural and subordinate under V1 is not the only null subject op option in French, right? If you were to say French is a partial null subject language, then you would expect, like Finnish or Hebrew, to have categorical expression of third person and maybe sixth person, but not of some of these persons. That's not, that's not the pattern you see. You have null subjects everywhere, but the rates are, can be quite low or a bit higher, depending on the case. Um, the, uh, if you've looked carefully at the table that was previ previously presented, you will have noticed that it's a second plural that is mostly overused, but not in all texts. So in sermons, it's a first plural. Now, if you add a partial null subject, a categorical language of that sort, you wouldn't expect that variation. Um, you have uh, only some of the text types that are concerned, um, not the, 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 the differences in sermons is not as strong and, uh, and, and they're not as strong in customal text as well. Uh, it's only found in some of the texts of the type and not always at the same temporal points, which is curious, right? And it does uh, involve some number uh, of uh, formulaic sequences. Il vous doit ce que désirez, typical of correspondence. Uh, which is repeated uh, regularly. Uh, can I say that's I like this. I have a minute, so I'll, I'll present it to you. Uh, it's a 1646 letter in uh, about slavery, inviting a um, an armateur, the the owner of a ship, to buy some slaves because he'll make lots of money that way. And you have, and that's all very sad. And but that's. The, not my uh, linguistic point here. If you look at the, the transcribed version, uh, you will see that you have the typical fifth person partial null subject patterns, but that's 1646. That's pretty late. That's much later than the chronolect that Wendy had established with different colleagues at around 1620. Um, so it would support the view that uh, this kind of pattern is not part of the primary competence of speakers. It's a writing convention that is found in certain text types. Um, so, my, conclude, my structural conclusion would be that uh, you have two null subject licensing systems in medieval French. You have a V2 system, that, which is you know, fairly 
classical asymmetric that declines with subsist that declines and that subsists with expletives essentially at the end of the day and then you got a kind of uh, partial null subject subsystem that is used for certain text types and that looks a lot as Cecilia was suggesting to me like adult topic drop uh, Agaman style but the problem of course is what about subordinates well it might be um, a feature of the fact that uh, romance languages have a richer subordinate left field as suggested by uh, data from Elisabeth Stach uh, about what contemporary WhatsApp and SMS um, communication where we see what? We see the same dual system. We see expletives which are uh, dropped at a higher rate, nearly 50% higher rate than anything else. And then you got fourth person uh, because you can hear the final uh, the agreement marker. Um, so that's where we are. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you to the wonderful team with whom I have the chance of working. questions. Pierre, uh, do you have, um, did you look at the pronouns, the use of pronouns? So the variation you, you looked at was the variation between no subjects and pronouns? Um, no, it was the no subjects and everything else. So if you got 197 over 1,000, I... I suppose I could have looked at just the subset of pronouns, but I did not. I just took, well, I took the third persons uh, for third persons, yeah. Okay, and my second question... But maybe I could break it down. Yeah. My second question, second question was about uh, subordinates. Uh, so I didn't understand. You, you find third person in subordinates? Um, hang on, what did I find? Uh, what, what, uh, what, what is striking and has been emphasized by different people is that you, you find the first and second plural overused, especially in correspondence, in subordinates. So, je veux que soyez uh, chez moi ce soir, whatever. Uh, and that, that's a striking fact. Do you find third person in that, uh, in that configuration? Uh, off the top of my head, no. So, yeah, but thank you for the suggestion of looking well, at because pronouns. Because I think of reading both games, uh -huh. uh, which we, is we considered all do. now as a partial subject language, no subject language. And you have the, you have a person in subordinate uh, clauses okay. when you have an antecedent in the mm -hmm. uh, main clause. I don't think you, I don't think I find a lot of that, if anything, in my data. Right? Yeah. Oh. Sam had a question. No, no, no. How about you? <coughs> oh, okay. um, so I had a question and an observation. So the question was, have you controlled for plus minus interrogative? Because my, my recollection mm -hmm. of the original claim by Barbara Vance, which I think was made based on comments by Vujda, was that was that with interrogatives introduced by Comment, etc., you get a higher rate of null subjects than you do. I, I, can, I, I took the interrogatives out. Okay, because yeah. that might be interesting to look at as to whether... Yeah, we don't have thousands, mm. but uh, given that you have to trawl through quite a lot of data, but yeah, I, I took them out assuming that it was something else. Yeah. And I suppose my, my observation was I, I can see why it's quite tempting the, um, the topic drop analysis. Mm -hmm. but I suppose I wonder if it's, it might work very well for a certain type of text to say it's sort of like the, the stuff that Liliana was talking about mm -hmm. in that publication. I, I suppose the more formal we become, or the, the higher register, maybe the less convincing the parallel becomes because she's talking so much about very specific types of communication, sure. like sure. text messages, diaries, etc. Diaries, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But here you have, ser well, you have sermons, but the, ri the writing down of it, so, you know, which, I mean, Lena could say more about that. 
uh, correspondence, and so which could fit the. Yeah, uh, so you think it might not apply to romance, for instance? I, I, think, the, I think the challenge is, uh, and, and this is an issue which I think I'm guilty of along with everyone else, is that topic drop and null topics are now being invoked in the literature for kind of a huge family of things which are for probably everything. more heterogeneous mm -hmm. than we, we might think. And, you know, there's a kind of null topic you seem to get in, say, the medieval languages, which I think is very different to, say, what you get in text messages in contemporary English or French or, you know, whatever. Sure, um, sure. I think it would be interesting in that respect to, on the point on formality, to check whether the, uh, what I call the partial null subject instances are really found in speech or in narration. And my recollection is that they're mostly speech. Mm, which would make, yeah. Which would, yes. yeah, which would answer that, that question. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you so much. for the stupid uh, <coughs> template of my university which doesn't allow line breaks in the uh, title of the slides. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I, anyway. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, the, the one, is, uh, I'm, I'm building different past corpora, uh, but I thought the most relevant today would be the uh, historical low German one. And uh, as a little bit of uh, background, um, there uh, has been a, a large-scale uh, initiative uh, within the German Science Foundation to build uh, historical reference corpora of all um, historical stages of uh, high and low German. And uh, part of that was uh, the reference corpus uh, Middle Low German and uh, Low Rhenish. Um, at the universities of Hamburg and Hanover, uh, uh, Han Hamburg and Münster, uh, and they were funded simultaneously with a, an application that I submitted uh, to the uh, Belgian Hercules Foundation, um, which was later taken open over by uh, the Flemish Science Foundation, um, to build a past corpus of Middle Low German. So we were funded at the same time and uh, talked to each other and decided to join forces, which was very fortunate for us, because we didn't, didn't have to transcribe such things ourselves. Uh, but uh, the deal was that uh, they do transcriptions, they already had a lot of digitized text, so we changed a bit the uh, composition of our corpus. Uh, but uh, we would help them pass a speech <coughs> tag their corpus because they didn't want to have a passed corpus. It's only part of a speech tag and lemmatized and morphologically tagged. Um, and in exchange, we could pass uh, on top of the uh, parts of speech tagging. <coughs> because this is the uh, workshop on uh, genre and text types, just 
a little uh, <laughs> overview of the distribution of text types in the REN, which uh, then, I mean, our, our corpus is much smaller than uh, the REN because parsing is much more uh, work. But we have the same problem. So uh, it's, it looks very colorful, but what you can see is that the older the texts are, the more uh, they are charters or legal texts or um, administrative texts, and the younger they are, the more literary texts they are. So mm -hmm. in a lot of uh, cases, um, unfortunately, what looks like diachronic variation is really, uh, you have administrative <laughs> texts in the 13th and 14th century, and after 1400, you have more uh, non-legal administrative whatever texts. Okay, um, that's something that we can unfortunately not do much about. It's not because uh, the Wren could have done better and we would have inherited it, but that's uh, how the attestation is. Um, so what we did is we uh, passed uh, a selection of 20 texts from the Wren uh, in order uh, to have a more or less balanced representation of the scribal languages, so we have four different scribal languages, which is uh, more or less the, the geographic uh, distribution, and uh, also different text types to the extent that it was possible, as I just uh, said. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we used the pen past corpora uh, parsing scheme, but the parts of speech tags are different because we inherited them from the red. So uh, those are the uh, hints. Tax head, tax head, which stands for Historical Low German tax, tax Head. Uh, but the nice thing is, of course, that uh, being a pen corpus, uh, you can include it in uh, a search across corpora with a corpus search query. Um, this is just a, a tree I stuck in to show you how we deal with uh, things like crossing branches. Uh, so uh, this is like an, a case of extraposition. And uh, we have, uh, at the point where the extraction happened, uh, something which uh, is insert category here, so it's like an empty category, which is like, there's a gap here, and then uh, an indexed uh, phrase uh, at the position where it occurred. Uh, but you can look at the full uh, documentation on our website. Uh, so being a, pass, a pen pass corpus, uh, it follows the same conventions that um, those of you who have worked with these corpora should be familiar with. Uh, so the clauses are usually tagged as IPs. Um, there's no VP. Um, all constituents are immediate constituents of the clausal node. If there is, um, or there are CPs, but they're only there if there's a reason to assume one. And this is not meant to be an analysis of Middle Low German syntax. It's to, to allow you to find stuff, and then you can do your analysis, if you will. Uh, this also means, for instance, I, I just showed you a case of an empty category. Uh, also traces, uh, we just put first, uh, and not where we hypothesize it might be. So this is up to whoever uses the corpus. Um, yeah, phrases have to be endocentric. Um, but we have a couple of Middle Low German specific conventions that we needed and that we can motivate. Uh, we have an article about it, but uh, you can also look at uh, the documentation on our website. You see here. And we have a search interface. So uh, normally you would have the PS PSD files and uh, search them with Corpus Search. Because we worked together with the REN and they were rather proprietary about their um, match between the texts and the parts of speech tags and the morphological tags, they didn't want us to give away uh, this text tag pairing like that. I don't know why, but okay, so the DFG paid a lot of money for it, and so if you want to search their corpus, it's, uh, there's an interface for it, uh, Anna's, it's very nice and useful, uh, mm -hmm. but you cannot get the text with the tags uh, next to it. And if you w were using our PSD files, of course you would get that, and that's what they don't want, so you have to use our search interface. Uh, but it can do most of 
what you want to do. Thanks. To put the second one. I am presenting. Please. I am presenting uh, the Tycho Brahe corpus uh, that I spoke of yesterday. It is based on the same scheme as uh, the corpus of Lord German, uh, so the pen uh, uh, schema. Um, it has uh, 95 texts from the. Uh, mainly from the 16th to the 19th century, but we have some texts before of the uh, 15th century and some texts of the 20th century. At the beginning, it was meant to, um, uh, to study the history of uh, European Portuguese, uh, mainly in this period, 16th, 17th centuries, and 18th also. Uh, <clears throat> but <clears throat> With the uh, time being, we have added a lot of uh, Brazilian text, and now uh, we are building also a corpus of um, Brazilian text documents inside the uh, Tico Bray corpus. Uh, it's um, so we have 95 texts now, which is almost four million words. Uh, uh, Two thirds are uh, part of speech tagged, and uh, one third, more or less, has a syntactic annotation, which means more or less one million three hundred thousand words. Uh, <clears throat> here, you can download the complete corpus uh, with syntactic annotation. If you want to uh, run queries, syntactic queries with corpus search, you can do it in your own. Um, computer, you can uh, uh, download uh, the corpus with post tagging and the complete corpus without annotation. Uh, <clears throat> here you can uh, find uh, the edition manuals, uh, the manual of the, this is in Portuguese, but uh, how we edit uh, the texts. Um, the manual of uh, <coughs> POS annotation and the manual of uh, syntactic annotation. And I stress the fact, which is for me extremely important, that this manual was um, built in collaboration with the Portuguese team and it is used uh, for not only for the Tico Bray Pass Corpus but also uh, for the Cordial C, which is a syntax-oriented corpus of Portuguese dialects organized by Ana Maria Martins. Uh, the past old Portuguese text, Washwell, uh, 
also organized by um, Anna Maria Martins, and the PS Corpus, of which I spoke yesterday as well. So this is important, this is important because altogether they have more or less two million uh, and a half uh, past sentences, which is a very good. Uh, as for myself, I think that it's much better to have a good, not very large past corpus than a very, very large corpus without passing annotation. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 I want to come back to the beginning, which is here. Ah, I've lost my first ah, page. It's here. Uh, so there is. So you can see the text. Um, oh. mm, I'm sorry. I thought it was more interesting to see the page directly than yeah. to make it. Ah, yes. So you have a lot of details on the text here, the number of words, the birth of the author. There are, in general, texts by authors with a big A. Um, and you have here um, <coughs> the mention about the annotation, POS or syntactic, the source text, if it was edited or not, but we try to use uh, reliable editions. And in general, from uh, some time to now, we use non-edited uh, texts. Uh, you also, uh, I, I, I have to do that. Isn't it? Okay. Uh, so uh, here we have a classification by genre, but I am a little bit ashamed of it. Uh, so uh, what I want to uh, show you also is uh, this. Uh, if you are interested in uh, Portuguese, you can use this interface to query, to make queries on um, tagged. Uh, texts, and uh, we have two thirds of our text uh, tags. So uh, you can, uh, for instance, you can have all the text here. You can use a graphical query, and you can choose tags or write a tag, uh, enter tag, for instance, and you put CL for clitic, okay, and you put it here and you can uh, search for clitics preceding, immediately preceding uh, verbs. Um, so I have to do that and this, and submit query. And normally it functions, but when you present it, generally it doesn't. Um, the dead view of the computers. Yes. So you have here, the, uh, it's run on a, a large quantity of text, you can see. Uh, and this is a translation in, oops. <laughs> you have the translation, you have 69 files here. And you have the translation in COP search language, CLI precedes VB or VB with something the verbs. Um, <clears throat> so the last thing I, I'd like to show is something in, uh, in construction, which is a platform, an online platform, uh, which is here. This is a Tico Bry platform because we like Tico Bry very much. Uh, and uh, this platform has a very ambitious goal which is to help people to make your corpus yourself. Uh, so we, we have tools. And you can see that there is, the, the historical corpus is here also, but we have a corpus, a Cadiweo corpus. Cadiweo is uh, an indigenous Brazilian language. I'm very sorry. I only wanted to show you, I, I think, a very 
it's not the same. White face. I'm extremely sorry. Yes, I, I only want to uh, show you um, the use of the... You have a rule-based parser that we use now for Portuguese after having used probabilistic, probabilistic parser during uh, a long, very long time, Dan Bickel, probabilistic parser. And now we use a, a rule-based parser uh, uh, the rule-based parser was built for Portuguese and um, uh, after a rule-based parser built by um, um, Beatrice Santorini for French. Uh, and it was uh, after there was a Spanish rule-based parser uh, built for the PS corpus and Catarina Magro uh, adapted uh, this rule-based parser for Portuguese. Uh, it is based, in fact, on uh, the rules of COP search. So, uh, I, and we, it was implemented here, so each point is a rule. And uh, I, this is a sentence of uh, one of the sentences I showed you yesterday. It rose a fortuna esta cidade do juiz de fora. We have a verb, uh, V1, uh, trouxe, a subject after it, and the object. It is a uh, VSO. Uh, so you do that, and you have the tree. And it is a very good tree. Uh, because you have, so the text was uh, tagged hmm, for part of speech. It is based on the part of speech. And here you can see that the subject, the PP and the NP act are perfect. There is a problem with the second PP uh, because of an error uh, uh, of tagging. Fora uh, in Portuguese can be the verb said. Uh, or can be an adverb, and here it was uh, wrongly annotated, and this is why the parser. Uh, so this is what we are working on now to simplify the work of people who want to have uh, an annotated corpus because I assure you it is worth um, uh, taking time to do that. Because after you have so much to do. Thank you. Thank you. So compared to the previous corpora, this one I'm going to present is rather small and but at least I will be brief. So. So as I mentioned in my talk, uh, this corpus and also the research grew out of these two previous projects and we had this Old and Middle Hungarian corpus of informal language use as our heritage. So the methods we used there uh, were applied to this new corpus. 
but we had to be somewhat more economical because there is no more research funding for building corpora, so we just had to smuggle it into a, a normal research project. Um, so this old and middle Hungarian corpus of, for informal language use that comprises uh, private letters and documents of which trials. And now uh, what we did is uh, we put uh, memoirs and drama texts into this new corpus. So memoirs are speech related because of their ego documents uh, and then drama uh, is built on constructed dialogues that imitate everyday language use in fiction. So the, the idea was that each of these uh, texts should uh, differ in one register or oriented feature and then we could make these comparisons. Uh, well, sometimes <coughs> no result comes out of that, but perhaps later on this will happen. And so uh, this is a, a small corpus really. So in the case of memoirs, uh, we went for uh, getting approximately similar sized excerpts uh, from different memoirs. And of course, we tried to privilege women authors, but there were only two in the entire middle Hungarian period. And one of those texts was really, really small. It, and it was something like a diary. So, but that, that was, that's in there too, because that's a text from a woman. <laughs> and that's, that is so scarce. And uh, in the case of dramas, we followed a little bit different approach because some of the very important early sources are relatively short. So we put them there and then we put other dramas in there in their entirety. So in the case of dramas, the length of the texts are not similar to each other. And again, uh, the predecessor was a gold standard corpus. So once we normalized the text, there was morphological annotation and then there was manual disambiguation. Uh, and, but that's a one million token corpus and that took a horribly long time. So we just had to let that go. And that means that this is at best a silver standard corpus. So whatever form is ambiguous and it gets a bad parsing, it, it's that way, I'm afraid. But it's still better, you, more usable than as, as if there was no parsing. So altogether, we try to make it balanced. So there is roughly the same number of tokens and characters from memoirs and dramas. And altogether, it's a little bit more than 200,000 tokens, which is, I know, it's really small compared to the previous corpora, but this is the amount we could get. And so just very quickly about the workflow, Selection of sources and text digitization, if necessary, those are standard things. But what we really struggle with is the process of normalization. Because there weren't orthographical conventions or there were several conventions. Uh, and we have to bring them to the modern standard in order to be able to parse these texts morphologically. And we had experiments with semi-automatic uh, normalization and it didn't work. So we had to stick to manual normalization. And this is a job that needs to be done by historical linguists. So it takes researcher time and we can't really afford it because then uh, in your end of year report, this is not something that's rewarded, you know, doing this kind of work. Uh, so what we did, we segmented uh, the text into clauses and sentences and systematically marked non-Hungarian texts, which is mostly Latin, but there are some other types of non-Hungarian insertions. Then we created this transcript uh, with preserving the original morphological structure but taking away all the phonological variation that's due to dialect differences and orthography uh, problems. And we added metadata to each of the texts, like author and genre and stuff like that. And so in the case of the older corpus, we were very, very strict about checking. So each uh, text, each normalized text was independently checked by two other people of the project. And then we also had these regular group meetings when we discussed the problems. Uh, because when more people work together, they don't, they don't always find things in the same way. So we had to go for homo homogeneity. Uh, yeah, uh, homogeneity, yeah. Uh, but uh, in this case, we also had to be more economical. So there is only one person checking uh, the work of the others. And then, of course, we also had these regular meetings to discuss problematic cases. And then morphological annotation uh, was done by our corpus linguistics colleague, uh, 
Uh, he used the humor morphological analyzer developed for modern Hungarian, but it was extended to handle both dilemmas that are not there in modern Hungarian, so it, the, the vocabulary was extended and also the morphological, the set of morphological text, text was extended to be able to parse these Middle Hungarian data. And uh, for the query interface, uh, we used the NoSketch engine system, uh, a very so a considerable advantage of this that it comes for free and it can be freely used for other corpora as well. And it's a very versatile uh, interface, so uh, all the functions of a search surface can be found there. You can make concordances, word lists and stuff like that. Uh, and then the concordance can be downloaded and manipulated and searched in different ways. Uh, we don't have a syntactic tagging system, uh, but Hungarian morphology is quite rich, so most of the syntactic phenomena can be searched for on the basis of morphological clues. So this is how we, you know, so feel, make ourselves feel better with respect to our conscience, that why don't we have syntactic <laughs> analysis? Uh, so uh, this is the state of the art right now. We have this query interface. Uh, we are in the process of still trying to make the data somehow better uh, by uh, finding the mistakes. But as I said, there won't be any systematic manual disambiguation. So it's only what we find while during the while we use the corpus. And so it is a really small corpus, and uh, it's, it's like a teaser corpus, you know? So you, you can find <coughs> traces of interest that you could work on further, but then you have to go on and search for more data manually. Uh, but normalization is really time consuming, and yet it cannot be skipped. So uh, it's kind of a, a bluff, but I'm really looking for some kind of uh, help like artificial intelligence, machine learning, or something like that, that could perhaps in a later stage, help us to do normalization more quickly and then it would be enough to check the data and then we could enlarge this in an easy way. And basically, uh, a short talk about the little corpus, that was it. Thank you. to understand spoken contemporary French, why would we use uh, la, la Quête du Saint Graal to understand 12, 20 French? And the answer is, well, there's nothing else. What else can we do? And so what I've been trying to do in the last seven or eight years, thanks to the wonderfully intelligent and artworking members of the team, like Mathieu Gou and Natasha Romanova, uh, among uh, others, is to create monogeneric corpora. Um, so the first, or one of the first big ones was called Condé, which is a series of customal uh, texts from Normandy and about that legal tradition in order to exclude factors of variation due to location, due to uh, text type, due to um, to subject matter, and of course, um, um, the, the question that arose is how do we do syntactic research with something that is only tagged for parts of speech, and hence development of these uh, more recent endeavors, uh, the Nikla Corpus, uh, 347,000 tokens to date, uh, ranging from the 13th to the 17th legal text from Normandy of two subtypes, 
uh, procedure styles and trials and the Chronicle Corpus, uh, even wider range, uh, 13th and the 19th, and their Norman Chronicles written in Normandy. And I know that Sam likes Chronicles, so I thought I'd mention this uh, and, and I'd emphasize this here. Uh, these, uh, so these are syntacti syntactically tagged, and they, um, yes, they obey this uh, syntactic annotation workflow, which I won't comment in great details because I don't pretend to understand it. Um, but we go from the text to a segmentation, tokenization, to the tagging part, parsing, to the levitization. I, I still don't quite understand how you can do syntactic tagging without doing the levitization, but I'm told that this is the way it is. And you got the conversion tax sets is worth mentioning because we have three morphosyntactic tag sets for parts of speech, which allows people using different corpora to, uh, to be uh, familiar with what we're doing. It's, it's a nice way to kind of extend the range of users, and all of these steps involve some amount of manual verification, retraining, and so on. Natasha can tell you everything about that. Um, so, uh, we're using the UPS uh, syntactic parser, which was uh, generated in tandem with the sh what is pronounced the Smurf corpus by uh, Prevost and Stein, and it's an honest parser of sentences is where the acronym comes from, and it does a Decent job. Uh, on this slide, what you should be seeing is. Uh, oh. Mm, oh dear. What you should be seeing is this little tree here, which you got on your end out. So, what OPS generates? Have you got. Have, they, have you appropriated all the end outs on this side? Are there no end outs at all? Or? Uh, so what you should see is this little UD tree. It's not a uh, pen style thing. It's uh, this. So this. It's a lexicalist syntactic approach. Um, it's uh, and it's a bit strange from a generative point of view. But the point is that it allows you to find whatever whatever it is you want to find. Uh, so that's what Ops produces. Uh, and I won't well, that's the address of uh, one. Mm -hmm. So one interface is, uh, which should have been shown. Here is the TXM. If you type in TXM Crisco, you will find the TXM uh, interface to search the texts, the Chronicles, Condé, or... Um, uh, but there is also another simpler interface, which you will see on, uh, on this page here, which I mm -hmm. photocopied for you. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, the way the TXM uh, works, it's got its own syntax, not necessarily something terribly easy or intuitive, but if you want to be looking for something in particular, uh, drop us a line and we'll be happy to suggest. So here, this is to find uh, auxiliary followed by a past participle, um, for instance. So you can do quite a lot in terms of syntax with take send, uh, and uh, which was initially devised to do uh, lexical searches. So essentially, if you want to find out out more, you have another visualization corpus, a search portal, which is much more uh, intuitive for the chronicle. Sam, that's the chronicle one. Uh, it's much easier than take Sam to handle. At the moment, it handles the chronicle corpus, which covers uh, seven, eight centuries. Eight centuries, and you have the take Sam to explore where you can read the text as well as search them. But, and if you have any uh, more detailed questions, please get in touch. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Oh, the issue, but all the links are on these um, 
bookmarks as well. So very nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's see what happens. What happened to your PowerPoint? Yeah, Francesco. Oh yes. Okay, luckily, basically, what I wanted to say has been already said by the people who came before me. Uh, I will uh, simply present the Venetian part of the Mikle project uh, because it's a binational project, and in Frankfurt, uh, we are handling actually all Venetian. And it's kind of a different uh, corpus because the initial uh, steps were different, basically. The texts we had, or we didn't have, were uh, a bit uh, more complex, let's say, to retrieve. The Venetian corpus spans from the 13th century to the 16th century, and it composed of legal, but also correspondence texts, because, uh, as you know, you get what you get, and you don't get a whole span of legal text in every language you want. So we decided also to integrate uh, some correspondences. There is a big difference with respect uh, to the uh, Mikle French corpus uh, in that uh, the parsing is done uh, following the UPEN guidelines. Basically, the guidelines I followed uh, uh, are the ones for Old French that are online and will be linked uh, in the, the description of the corpus uh, done by Beatrice Santorini. There is just a couple of uh, adjustments that I made, like objects are called ob1 and not ac, but yeah, those things are easy to point out. And there is a tag for clitics, obviously, which is a bit more precise and adapted to the Venetian. And then, at the end, what's interesting is that uh, this is transformed in an XML by Mathieu and a set of uh, scripts done by him, which will allow to search uh, this corpus, not only with corpus search, but with the tools also that Pierre presented before. So it will also be available, obviously, in the PSD file, so you will be able to download the files if you want to use corpus search and search directly the files, but also to use the tools that Pierre presented before. Okay. Now, a brief presentation of the text that you will find in the corpus, the blue ones, or turquoise ones, <laughs> are uh, the ones that we had to transcribe directly from manuscripts. So it's quite uh, a lot, and it was a lot of work, obviously. Luckily, we had uh, Natasha helping us, and uh, a lot of other people, EV students, who lent their work. Uh, also, teaching opportunities. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Some of the students. For me too, because I learned a lot in the process. I still remember your face when you saw a manuscript for the first time. Yes, <laughs> I, was, I was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> this basically comes from uh, us going to the archives of Venice looking for manuscripts, and they were uh, all very humid being in Venice. So. <laughs> but it's nice. It's, uh, it was a very, a very wonderful experience. So, uh, this basically. All the texts come from legal ma our legal material, except for the Zucchello letters, the Arbel letters, and the Morosini letters. There are differences, obviously, among the legal materials you can find. Uh, some are uh, custom laws, like Statuti di Murano or Statuta Veneta. <coughs> some, instead, uh, are, uh, let's say, administrative texts, in which there is uh, an administrator that writes down something in a formalish way, like this Denot in County, where they were basically renting the ships for merchants, or the Senato Terra, and also, I think, uh, no, that's it. Then uh, there is a set instead of a stream of legal material which contains more, uh, let's say, uh, low level speech, uh, which includes direct speech, 
like the Leo Mazur, the continuation of the Leo Mazur, <laughs> which will come out soon, and the Avogaria. And this is basically what we have been able to find. The other colors there basically means what you will find uh, right now, what you could find. The TXT means that it's just the TXT that is... Uh, uh, yes. Then uh, you have the tokenized version of it, then the part of speech tagged, and then the parsed. Obviously the parsed version, since parsing takes a lot of time, uh, is not uh, the whole set of the corpus, but the ones that are not within parentheses are the ones that we would like, uh, within the end of the project, to bring to the final form, to the final parsed form. So basically this one and other three will not be parsed because it's not feasible within these projects, but the others, hopefully, if I manage to find the time to but parse them all, but also they will the be. Parser, parser works, like yes, maybe, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Because we are also building some kind of uh, automatic parser that, mm -hmm. yeah, but let's uh, wait what's, what's before space, announcing yes, it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, an example of uh, what we did. This is a part of the Avogaria that's directly the manuscript. And you can uh, see here the writing and, uh, and Louis, Disseke, and so on. And that's the final result. <laughs> After a lot of work, uh, that manuscript gets uh, in this form, uh, which is the standard uh, UPen uh, uh, annotation. I think it's time, uh, basically, to go eating. And what I wanted to say is that if you want to get in touch with me for the workflow, for a bit of uh, scripts that I developed for helping for part of speech tagging and reusing the results, just send me an email and uh, we can talk about it and I will happily share my scripts. Uh, this is what you can do with Corpus Search, but I think people who already use Corpus Search know, so you can do a lot of stuff and it's extremely interesting and uh, basically that's it. That's a QR code for downloading the MIPLE queries that we use for uh, analyzing V2 within uh, uh -huh. the MIPLE corpus. So if you're interested... Uh, also here for is, yesterday's uh, presentation. Yeah. For yesterday's presentation it's another set okay. of queries, uh, but this is the one that we used for another uh, article. But, right. We don't get go back in time yet. It will be a nice project. Yes, yes. Build a time machine. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So we're we're having lunch now. Let's make sure to be back so that we have two hands who will be from Zoom. Talking to us from Zoom waiting. So uh, that gives you an hour and forty two minutes. Yes, it is. It is. But let's uh, let's wait and see because uh, we still have to read read the months.
Um, right now we have the pleasure to welcome Ernst van Kemenade, um, who is joining us from Nijmegen, and who is going to tell us what metrical poetry can tell us about word order change, which is indeed a very interesting topic. So, uh, Ernst, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this online. I would have loved to be there, uh, but that was not possible this time. So um, I'm happy to do it this way. Uh, right, what well, metrical poetry can tell us about word order change. Uh, this is not an overall, um, you know, generalized what could happen in principle. It's a very concrete case study um, in which uh, I consider uh, uh, I look at one very specific verse text in order to attempt to resolve an issue about the loss of verb second and the grammaticalization of auxiliaries in the history of English. Yeah, so, so that's the, the, the key of the talk. Uh, um, uh, I will do that with very concrete evidence. Um, poetry and verse as data materials often left aside by syntacticians, of course, because you know, they fear the complications that the meter and the poetic language uh, might give rise to. Um, so it's considered a tricky source of material as rhyme and meter may distort uh, the, you know, what we would want to dis reconstruct uh, from uh, the textual material. Um, I do the opposite here. I look at a verse text precisely because it may, uh, there is some echo. But, okay, I look at the verse text precisely because it may be an opportunity to look at strict meter. Um, uh, and that is specifically the case uh, in the text we're looking at. So I will show that that permits insights about syntactic variation conditioned by metrical structure. Uh, and those are insights that could not straightforwardly be derived from any prose text. Uh, the specific verse text is the Ormulum. Uh, written around 1200 uh, in uh, probably in Lincolnshire in, in England and it consists of some 30,000 um, it's, it's thought to have been originally around 60,000 but uh, the other half was lost apparently um, it's a religious text homilies and uh, uh, sermons and, and, and uh, that sort of thing written in a spelling system that is designed to indicate vowel length by doubling the consonant following a short syllable. And it is furthermore written in a very strict septenarius meter, very strict indeed, which is by, why lots of people get very bored uh, of reading the Omnium. Uh, um, but, you know, here's the opening line, which is kind of fun, because uh, Ormulum is called Ormulum because Orm wrote it, yeah? Uh, the first line goes, This spoke is nemnet Ormulum for thee that Ormit rochte. Okay, it shows the septenarius meter, uh, four metrical foot, uh, feet in the, in the first half line, uh, three plus a weak syllable at the ending of the second half line, yeah? And it means this book is named Ormulum because Orm <coughs> wrote it, or Orm wrote it. So the monk was called Orm. Uh, he was an Augustinian monk. That's about all we know about him. The sort of trying to sort out at the moment which monastery he was in. Um, okay, so uh, very strict meter indeed, which is why it's so useful. It's not, uh, you know, haphazardly mixing things uh, because that would always confuse you as a linguist. Uh, the date of around 1200 is also very fitting as the 12th century in England is a period of sweeping transition in grammar and syntax uh, for which we would dearly have more texts. Uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, good uh, prose corpora for the you know south uh, southeast midlands and for the southwest midlands, uh, but that's about it. Uh, for the rest, there are you know major gaps in the textual record, so Orm has done us a favour. And you know Orm is thought to have been a highly trained monastic, and you know having looked at this text for quite some time now. Um, you know, I realized that, you know, this guy was a bit of a linguist too, you know, he, he knew what he was doing. Uh, and I will uh, hopefully be able to show that to you as well. 
Um, so to give a couple of examples, all spelling of long and short vowels can tell us how sound changes such as open syllable lengthening are progressing. <coughs> One of the key changes in early Middle English uh, that you know, phonologists are extremely interested in. Something that is relevant uh, uh, even for the present day Dutch spelling system uh, as well. Um, Ons meter can tell us how the loss of verb and noun endings is progressing because of this alternation between weak and strong syllables. Uh, and Ons meter can tell us where or indeed whether pre auxiliaries are stressed or not. Okay, so pre auxiliaries. Um, verb second and the status of auxiliaries, notably the metrical status of auxiliaries. Uh, I'm talking about uh, only a part of verb second that is attested in the history of English. The history of verb second in English is awesomely complicated. Um, but, you know, the, the part that I'm discussing today is the clearest part, and, uh, and that is where we find uh, feet of force movement, okay, in a slightly more old fashioned generative terms, feet to C movement. And that is a term that is used for asymmetric V2 uh, uh, phenomena, uh, V2 phenomena restricted to root clauses. Okay, this is not general uh, in, in the history of English, Old and Middle English, I'm talking about in particular, of course. Uh, it's uh, restricted to t three fairly clearly defined uh, contexts. Uh, questions uh, in A and B. Uh, why would God uh, such, a small, such a small thing deny him? Uh, negative initial clauses, uh, see not is the sinful soul at all turned, uh, and uh, see uh, clauses introduced by uh, them, and then covers two adverb like things here, tha and thona. They both literally mean then. Uh, but, you know, they have, uh, you know, beside their adverbial meaning, they have a lot of grammaticalized meanings in Old English as discourse particles, clause linkers, uh, clause contrasters, correlative markers, uh, what have you. So, you know, then, you know, looks like an odd choice, um, but, you know, then was, was deeply entrenched in the system of clause linking and, and um, discourse referentiality and um, uh, elocutionary force and what have you. Yeah, okay, so at the bottom, the takeaways, main clauses only, lexical verbs as well as auxiliaries, so that's where even in questions uh, it differs from present day English, uh, and more or less restricted to specific initial elements, WH words. Uh, you know, the, the uh, clause initial uh, negative particle, ne, unstressed uh, syllable in Old English, and to tha and thona. Uh, yeah, okay, well, this is, uh, uh, I added this uh, because I thought, oh, that must be text linguists as well, and, you know, maybe they don't, they don't know all that machinery, so I won't do a tree diagram. Um, but, uh, you know, the first three columns are, of course, this, this part of the left periphery of uh, main clauses. Um, main issues of the talk, uh, I will first uh, discuss some further properties of to force verb second in Old English, and then consider how to force develops over the Middle English period and is lost over the Early Modern period. Um, the claim I will make about the loss of feet force following adverbs is that this is caused by the reanalysis of auxiliaries as functional heads, resulting in the loss of primary stress on auxiliaries. Okay, that claim, of course, implies that before this loss, pre-auxiliaries could still carry primary stress, uh, and that is uh, contra runs counter to uh, the only serious work that has been done about auxiliaries in poetry uh, in Old English. Uh, Michael Getty in these two studies claims that auxiliaries were already stressless before the turn of the millennium. Um, okay, so, so doomsday uh, was there for auxiliaries as well. Um, um, this, is, this whole claim is based on the comparison of uh, 
But, but what you see uh, for Oxidi Greece and Beowulf, oh, very, very early Old English text, and a 300 line uh, poem, the only one of which we know that it was written in the 10th century because it describes a battle that took place in the, uh, the 10th century, the Battle of Malden. Um, I suspect uh, that uh, what, what we see in terms of differences between these texts, I'm, I'm not going to deal with that because that's a very complex issue. But yeah, I think the issues are independent of, of you know, possible stress on auxiliaries. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a serious question that needs to be addressed. But then, of course, I address it by going to Ormond, which was written two, two centuries later, and one of the few Middle English texts in which we can get a clear picture of prosody because of that very tedious and regular meter. Um, and so there we can see whether auxiliaries in key to force constructions can be stressed. Okay, the curve of evolution. Um, so my claim is that as in Old English as well as Middle English, all verbs could move to force, you know, as long as it was in these, in this restricted set of contexts, in spite of the morphological reductions like loss of stem extensions and reduction of verb endings that was characteristic of the transition from Old English to Middle English. Okay, so finite verbs, including auxiliaries, carried stress on the stem. Uh, stem on the uh, stress on the stem of auxiliaries uh, was lost in early Model English as auxiliaries were reanalyzed as function words. It's this, this very famous uh, uh, change uh, uh, which goes hand in hand with the rise of do support, uh, on which you know a lot of work has been done, uh, and uh, you know this is in line with uh, uh, the claim that auxiliaries became function words and no longer carry stress. Okay, that latter part is what I add, uh, uh, but yeah, of course it's a highly highly relevant question and um, you know relevant for you know, grammaticalization processes as they are, uh, you know, weakening, weakening processes often thought across the board. So, you know, why not in, in terms of stress as well? Okay, now the thing is that of, of these old English environments that I discussed, questions and negative initial clauses maintained inversion with auxiliaries, you know, fronting of lexical finite verbs was lost as well, and that's interrelated with this change, but it's it's not directly the same change. It's, it's, it, it, it has a, uh, a trajectory that lasts longer into the early modern period. Okay, so questions and negative initial clauses maintained inversion with auxiliaries up to the present day, and these adverb initial clauses were then <coughs> such as uh, what is repeated here, then should we at least withstand, they lost it. Okay, so why did questions and negative initials maintain it, and why did adverb initial clauses lose it? Yeah? Okay, some assumptions. Uh, Pre-auxiliaries around 1200, the time of Ormion, could but need not be stressed. Initial adverbs could be stressed, but they were mostly unstressed, unless they were episode boundary markers uh, in late Middle English. Okay, that's of course a text linguistic issue. In contrast to questions and from late Middle English onward, constructions such as focal negative initial clauses like never would I do such a thing. Okay, what is the basic cause of this? Um, in the sequence, initial XP, uh, auxiliary and pronominal subject, uh, because, you know, that's the heart of the, of the V to force movement. Pronominal subject is the only unambiguous V to force movement context. Okay, so these two uh, light uh, forms uh, by late Middle English formed one prosodic foot consisting of three syllables. And of course, the prosodic foot has to contain one stressed syllable, at least one. Okay, that is a general and basic prosodic requirement. Okay, that works okay for questions because there the initial WH element is stressed. Why would you do that? 
Uh, and in the focal negative initials, same thing. Never would I do such a thing. But what about these unstressed uh, shorthand firms? Then Lee finishes novel. Yeah. So that's what happened when auxiliaries could no longer be stressed. When you could no longer say, then will he, then will he finish his novel? Uh, okay. This inversion pattern, this verb second pattern is lost. Okay. So the data. How do we show this? Uh, well, first I showed that in Old English there was no difference between lexical finite verbs and auxiliaries. Yeah, that's this step back. If you look at that uh, uh, table, um, uh, you s okay, what, what I do there is uh, uh, 02 period and 03 period, those are the two, you know, very uh, uh, well represented in prose texts. Uh, 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 sub periods of Old English. Uh, together, they're, they're from 850 to 1050. Okay, this is then initial uh, uh Well, if you look at that inversion, in about, uh, in, in over, well over 90% of the cases. Yeah, so that's the generalization uh, that I showed on the first example slide. Uh, I haven't shown uh, examples of uh, clauses uh, starting with other adverbs, but look at the percentage there. It's under 10 percent. Yeah, uh, no distinctions between auxiliaries and lexical verbs. So you know everything. You know all verbs could leave the verb phrase and go all the all the way up to force. Um, so no distinction. Very high rates of inversion following then very low rates following other adverbs. Okay, now we go to Middle English. Uh, I've, uh, I've uh, done this in terms of curves, curves of easy evolution, so to speak. Um, okay, what you see in the Middle English period, if you look at the blue lines, the blue lines is the development of inversion following then and following other adverbs when the finite verb is a auxiliary or pre-auxiliary, as we should uh, say uh, properly. Yeah? So following then, um, you know, well, it's not above 90% anymore as it was in Old English, but it was, you know, 70% in the early Middle English period. And, you know, it was still very robust, uh, nearly 60% uh, at the end of the E1 period. The end of the E1 period is 1570, yeah? So... Um, uh, what we see is stability for inversion uh, following then with auxiliaries, uh, but, uh, you know, a substantial reduction for lexical finite verbs, both types. Not much distinction between them, but that doesn't matter for the moment. If you look at inversion following other adverbs, the rightmost uh, uh, graph, there you see something very interesting. That was below 10% in Old English. Um, uh, but we see a rise, a, you know, a consistent rise uh, over the Middle English period of inversion with auxiliaries uh, and not with lexical verbs. Now, isn't that interesting? Um, so, V to force following then is robust until 1570 and that follow, then followed by a sharp decline, sharp loss, rise of V to force following other adverbs. You know, uh, okay, that's a distinct rise as we see. We see that peak in the second diagram, um, and uh, uh, followed by a loss uh, from 1500 onwards. Oh, I have to rush. Um, this rise, interestingly, is restricted to short data count verbs like here, there, thus, now, yet. Yeah, it's it's not any adverb uh, that uh, takes part in. Okay, it's an adverb that an adverb that was like then in Old English. Actually, you know, they, they then lost some of those uh, multifactorial uses, but it maintained its its you know discourse linking adverb kind of use, and that is of course what adverbs like here and there and thus and now and so on do as well. Okay. Importantly, this is consistent across dialects. It's not some idiosyncrasy of a couple of texts. 
Okay, so a recent paper I published with Roland Hinterholzer and Tara Streik argues that the loss of inversion following adverbs in the transition from E1 to E2 is due to the grammaticalization of auxiliaries to unstressed function words. Okay, that dating of uh, the analysis of auxiliaries is according to you know, the most uh, authoritative work on this, and that is Anthony Warner's 1993 book. Uh, these are the figures on which the graphs are based, so I'll skip those. Now we go to Ormulum. Now we, we're going to look at what happened around 1200 uh, as diagnosable in poetry, uh, metrical poetry. Okay, almost very high rates of inversion. In part, that is Scandinavian influence, but, uh, you know, we checked thoroughly uh, that, uh, you know, it was consistent across dialects. So, you know, this... this you know, higher rates and, and distinctions between then adverbs and other adverbs are attested, you know, across the dialects. So it was something independent of Scandinavian influence. Okay, uh, an example, one, you know, one example from Orm, that if we are two, uh, pre-auxiliaries can carry, carry stress on the stem in Ormium. Okay, so the A example, yet will it shower you for hui? Uh, so, yet is unstressed, will is, uh, yet will, I, want, I, uh, uh, itch is the subject pronoun. Uh, so, that's interesting, and another is be, tha, mach tu laken god with all. Uh, then, might you, uh, oh, well, what the hell, what is laken? Uh, something that we can do to God, apparently. Um, interestingly, uh, the A sentence also shows that Orm, and he does that very frequently, spells the unstressed verb ending, the, the E in Wille, uh, uh, followed by the unstressed pronominal subject. Uh, okay, so you have to get the meter right, you have to say, yet will it shower you for hui. Uh, and uh, so that shows uh, that Orm is aware that that unstressed verb ending was still there, so he wants to spell it, but for the sake of the meter, it doesn't really, it, you know, it assimilates with the initial vowel of the personal pronoun, yeah? So that's interesting too. So, so you know, this guy knows what he's doing uh, in terms of what he puts in, in, in stressed positions and not. Okay, uh, now, the crux of the matter, I, I here have uh, uh, two columns uh, uh, with one initial short deictic adverb here, here um, uh, you know, which alternates between inversion and no inversion. You know, clearly inversion and no inversion were two options. They were two grammatical options. Okay, so uh, uh, in the leftmost column, uh, with uh, 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 inversion, the initial adverb is unstressed and the auxiliary is stressed. You can tell from the meter here, habit, shower, thrin, and lag. Here, speakage of unkleine men, uh, and so on. Yeah? Uh, when you have no inversion, here is uh, stressed, uh, uh, and the stem of the auxiliary is stressed too, but the stem of the auxiliary is in the second, uh, uh, in the second foot. Yeah? And here it will a shall on you. Uh, uh, and, you know, this can be done with uh, lexical uh, verbs as well. If you look at the bottom of the example, for here is sail, here I see full uh, with Lee, sorry. Okay, so uh, interestingly, we have inversion, leftmost column, first takeaway at the bottom, the first little arrow, the verb ending of the first person in all cases is assimilated with the following pronoun into one unstressed syllable. Uh, and, the, and in the second one, the own inversion, the verb ending is the unstressed syllable in the meter. Here uh, it's yeah, I'm uh, doing my best to round up as quickly as I can. Um, okay, I'll, I'll skip the, the, the text linguistic bit. 
Okay, the third takeaway is important. Ohm accommodates both word order options in the meter as stressed verb forms, right? Uh, that's the important thing. That's what I wanted to know. Okay, here are, uh, this is a graph of all the uh, initial adverbs uh, uh, which uh, were uh, unstressed uh, most of the time, uh, but all played with the meter in such a way that both inversion and non-inversion could be accommodated. Okay, so uh, some discussion and conclusion. There's a good deal of variation in frequencies between initial adverbs in all, ORM, but the overall picture is that ORM accommodates auxiliary stems in the meter as stressed syllables. That's the main conclusion. Uh, Pre-auxiliaries could be stressed in Middle English. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the final takeaway of this. Uh, they were reanalyzed later as unstressed function words over the late 16th and early 17th century. And that was no problem for questions and focal negative initials. Why would you do that? And never would I do such a thing. Uh, but this, this was just not good enough for these unstressed uh, initial uh, deictic uh, adverbs. And that's why this was lost and at a fairly rapid pace as well. Yeah. Um, then, of course, the question that was questioned by one of the referees of our paper, is there independent evidence that this scenario is correct? Yes, I think there is, from another piece of poetry, namely Shakespeare. Okay, we look at other metrical poetry. Shakespeare wrote his sonnets in a period around 1600. That was the period of, you know, the final loss of verb second here. Uh, he shows several cases of inversion following an adverb like then. I also have examples with here and so on. But whenever this happens, the adverb is in a crucial, that is, stressed position in the meter, introducing each quatrain and sometimes even the couplet. So here's a sonnet. A sonnet consists of three quatrains, four line uh, uh, thingamies. Um, uh, and it ends with a couplet, uh, to, a two-line conclusion. Okay, so what do we see here? So the, obviously the beginning of a quatrain is very important. It starts, when to the sessions of sweet silent thoughts. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Uh, on to the second quatrain, then can I drown an eye. And the third quatrain, then can I grieve. Obviously, this first position in the quatrain, what you then get is trochaic inversion. You get a yambic foot rather than a trochaic one. And, you know, there is good reason here because, you know, the transition to a new, new uh, quatrain has to be clearly marked, yeah? So, uh, uh, I have quite a few other of those examples and, uh, you know, that confirms my conclusion on the basis of all uh, that uh, you know, by 1600, you could no longer have inversion with an unstressed first syllable. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very insightful talk. And now we have time for one, maybe two very, very fast questions. Can you hear her? Can you hear um, me? Uh, 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 sort of, yes, please. Hi, Hans, this is Kristin. Just a question for the Shakespeare. Um, do you think that, uh, wouldn't you say that the, uh, the auxiliary is stressed in Shakespeare as well? Then can I grieve at grievances foregone, according to the meter? Uh, I would think not, because if you stress an auxiliary, then you're creating a contrast with something that would, you know, say can, uh, uh, well, then you form a contrast with the context. So the context should mention something that was not possible before. But isn't Shakespeare's sonnets are yambic pentameter? Da, 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 da. Yes, but they do have, in crucial places, they have trochaic inversion. Uh, and uh, and this is, these are cases of trochaic inversion, yeah. Uh, you know, can is not in contrast here, uh, so it doesn't receive stress. You know, but, uh, but initial adverbs and, and auxiliaries, over the Middle English period, you see some variation, uh, but if you, if you have a stressed auxiliary, 
then it forms a contrast uh, with uh, with something that was not can yeah, that was not possible. So I read this as a, as an unstressed auxiliary. Yeah. With stress on then. Well, yeah, then can I drown an eye unused to flow, and then can I grieve at grievances forgone. Uh, that's how I would read it. But uh, uh, I know that uh, Shakespeare is young, but there's, uh, there's a, there are libraries full of literature on trochaic inversion. Um, I, I read those as cases of trochaic inversion, but it's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll think on it. And, and I'll look at the contrast options for the auxiliary that I have. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we'll have to stop here. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a use of the subtitle option, <laughs> which is not so restricted for some reason. And uh, because uh, my talk is not going to concern so many different genres, I thought I'd throw in an extra one in the form of a song title. Um, right, so uh, as you might know, or probably not, uh, in Dutch, present day Dutch, there is um, in those verbs that have uh, non-syncretic, uh, or have no syncretism between third and second person, uh, agreement variation with the polite pronoun U. Uh, so for instance, uh, according to the uh, language advice uh, of the uh, region of uh, Flanders, you are free to choose between U uh, hebt and U heeft, so second person or third person, and you can't and you can't, and only with the, uh, the verb to be, uh, sein, uh, it mentions that uyes uh, is a bit archaic. I talked to some uh, native speakers and uh, they actually find it outright weird. Uh, but uh, it's possible according to the Talapins. Uh, another uh, piece of background is uh, that um, there is a cyclic uh, development in uh, the second person pronouns in the history of Dutch where uh, we start out in Middle Dutch with a system uh, as you uh, still have it in uh, German, more or less, and as you had in historical English, with du uh, uh, or du in uh, the singular and he in the plural. And as in English, the plural form uh, took over also in uh, the singular. And then, in uh, as that happens uh, in the uh, 17th, so this happens in the 16th. And then in the uh, 17th and 18th uh, century, uh, which will be relevant for my talk today, uh, you additionally have um, so-called epistolary forms of address uh, in letters, uh, which I will say something about in a second. And uh, today, uh, at least standardly, you have um, a, a two-form, like an informal form, um, which is uh, you and ye and the in the nominative and uh, you and yao in the when it's an object and yuli which is derived from uh, uh, so you people uh, in the plural 
and as the Wu form, uh, you have uh, U all throughout. Okay. Now, the question I want to uh, uh, talk about today is uh, how the agreement <coughs> with this originally uh, oblique uh, form U, so U is uh, originally the oblique form of Ye, uh, developed uh, once it began to be used as a subject around mm -hmm. 1600. Okay, so, and this is why my talk is titled You Are What You Is. Um, also because I like Zappa. Um, and uh, there are basically two hypotheses in the literature which make different uh, predictions. Uh, for the hacker, uh, says that the nominative use arose through a reanalysis from the um, oblique use, uh, which is something that uh, maybe for the hacker wasn't aware of yet, but uh, happened again <laughs> in uh, Dutch, uh, very substandardly in the north. Uh, people say, lopen, like them walk, instead of uh, they lopen, uh, they walk. Um, which is not such a new phenomenon, apparently Anne Frank did it in her diaries uh, and her father edited it out, that's why we don't know about it. Uh, um, so that would, that would predict uh, that the second person is older because it's really uh, Hye just um, with, the, with the agreement of Hye. Okay. Um, the alternative uh, hypothesis is that uh, U arose via an intermediate step, namely those epistolary <coughs> forms that I mentioned. Um, and so far, I've only shown you the abbrevi uh, abbreviations in the table, but they stand for um, a possessive pronoun and a noun, uh, some honor honorific noun. Uh, so it's uedele or uliefde, uh, your, your honor or your kindness. And um, that's uh, used in letters. And that would lead us to expect that third person is older because u would be a pronomalization of uh, a noun, really, okay? So the verb should agree with the noun, liefde or uh, edele. Okay, so uh, oh, I'm uh, going to present you my corpus study next. Um, because uh, very, I had sent you a, a slides where it goes a bit more slowly, but okay, anyway, you see everything at the same time. Uh, you need the right kind of text to look at epistolary forms of address, namely letters. <laughs> and we're very, very lucky that we have such a corpus from exactly that period. Uh, I could just as well have had nothing to say <laughs> today. Um, and that's the Letters of Lute uh, corpus. So um, uh, in the 17th uh, throughout, uh, through to the 19th century, um, Dutch people sent letters uh, home uh, or to people uh, abroad uh, which were transported on ships and those were sometimes captured by the British and 40,000 of those letters are currently still sitting in um, British archives. Uh, a thousand of them have been uh, transcribed and annotated um, which doesn't sound like <coughs> so much but I can tell you it's a lot. Um, and because I wanted to look at at least one more text type, uh, I also looked at the Kurantin Corpus, which is 17th century news newspapers. Uh, it's as good as it gets. Uh, you will see that it's not entirely uh, useful, but uh, a little bit. Okay, so the Letters of Lute Corpus is uh, annotated, uh, post tagged and lemmatized, and very thankfully contains sociolinguistic um, information, but unfortunately no syntactic parsing, so you can construct a very complicated query which allows you to find only u plus verb or verb plus u, but not embedded clauses where the verb is uh, removed from the pronoun. Uh, so I had to look for all the occurrences of u edle and u liebde manually and <laughs> out of over 8,600 occurrences, sift out those 621 uh, subject uses because it's also used as an object and uh, as a possessive pronoun. Um, right, so there's uh, a lot of useful sociolinguistic uh, information, also less useful information such as the name of the ship. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> when I coded my data, I added uh, information on uh, which verb it was in case that was uh, important. 
uh, the position of the verb, uh, is it, um, you know, I will show you the inverted uh, verb second, straight verb second, or in the end of the clause, which form the verb has a third or second person. Uh, the approximate uh, birth year, where possible, which I reversed engineered from uh, the age information as far as it was given, and uh, the province and the social class. So in, in that corpus, we have two periods, uh, the second half of the 17th and the second half of the 18th century. Uh, for the newspaper corpus, we don't have quite so much information. We have it's uh, short pieces of news. Uh, I showed you a, a little picture there before. Um, it's short pieces of news which say where the report comes from and so on. Uh, and uh, I found some 350 occurrences of uh, these epistolary forms, about uh, 75 of which were subject uses. Okay? And uh, this is where you see the different uh, positions of uh, the verb. So you have here. Um, inversion context, so you have uh, something in the first position, then the finite verb, and then this form of address. <coughs> and um, you can see that there's variation. Kunt and kann, zal, uh, zult also exists, uh, hebt, heeft also exists, and the same, and, and in the letters as loot as well as in the newspapers. Um, we also have a straight verb second, so the subject first, and then the finite verb. I only have a, a second person uh, example from the newspapers uh, here. And then in embedded clauses, the verb comes <coughs> later. It doesn't have to be in the last position, but um, yeah, it comes later. Okay. So um, this is just the, the bare numbers. Um, and you can already see a couple of um, trends, perhaps. First of all, in uh, the 17th century, if you look at the uh, Kurantin corpus uh, for now, you see that second person is actually much more frequent. Mm -hmm. It's not frequent. Uh, nothing is frequent in the Kurantin corpus because most of the things are news and not letters. Uh, but uh, you see a certain uh, tendency to use second person. In the letters of salute, you see that in embedded clauses, especially. And you see that in the 18th century, third person seems to uh, gain ground. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, I recorded the data as I got them from the uh, Institute of the Dutch Language uh, a little bit. Uh, so I already said that I recorded the age to the approximate birth year. So if it says uh, that a person was born, uh, sorry, a person was between 30 and 50 years old in 1680, then I uh, say, okay, it's probably around 1640 that the person was born. Then uh, there are uh, a lot of places uh, where we have only like one letter or two letters. So there's very little uh, information. I uh, recorded them as other uh, to reduce noise, but it's still quite noisy. So in the end, I decided to only look at uh, four contigu contiguous uh, provinces. Oh, it's actually three provinces. Uh, it's the city of Amsterdam in North Holland, North Holland, Zuid Holland, and uh, Zeeland. Uh, and I, with, with those, uh, from those uh, 621 tokens, I kept uh, 445. Uh, I um, uh, did a Brennan Forest uh, analysis to see which uh, of the uh, independent variables had a, uh, an important influence on uh, the use of third person or of second person. And uh, the position of the verb had clearly the greatest uh, influence. Also, when uh, a letter writer was born had a great influence, and from which province there were, gender still had a slight influence. Uh, which verb it was didn't have at all. So, what I said about present-day Dutch, uh, that you have a certain preference for uh, event uh, over uis or so, didn't seem to play such a big role. Okay, so I uh, ran a binary logistic regression. And uh, I could walk you through this, but uh, as we are talking about the curve of evolution, I plot the <laughs> equations as, uh, as curves for you. Uh, so this is um, the influence of um, the position of the verb. I don't know why it always says percent. It's the probability of uh, using third person. And you can see that uh, clearly 
third person is the incoming variant, it's the new variant, right? And in inversion <coughs> contexts, it's already at the time when people start using U as a subject around 1600, or at least that's the birth year uh, <laughs> that I uh, guessed. Uh, it's already uh, a very high percentage of uh, third person, while uh, verb second, straight verb second and um, embedded contexts really lag behind like um, 100 years or more. Okay. Um, the province uh, was also uh, an important factor. Um, we don't see such a huge difference between Amsterdam and North Holland. Uh, Amsterdam being in North Holland is maybe not so surprising, uh, but you see a clear difference uh, the further away you move from Amsterdam. Okay, So this is really like a geographic diffusion mm -hmm. pattern. Um, and uh, gender has a certain influence. So uh, women, uh, start earlier and progress faster um, and are like one or two generations ahead of the men in using the pattern. Okay, so what do I make of this? Um, as I said clearly, uh, third person is the incoming uh, form, second person is older, is gradually replaced. Uh, and this is actually uh, in line with um, findings from the earlier literature so this was a paper by Patrick Group uh, on uh, the, chain, the cyclic change in pronouns, not so much uh, about the agreement. But uh, the first cases of subject U that he finds uh, just before 1600 are with second person. And also, as we've seen in the Codantin corpus, uh, which I couldn't evaluate uh, statistically because we only have this <laughs> small uh, window without... Um, linguistic information, uh, second person dominates, third person is rare. And uh, in the letter to the Lute corpus, we have this uh, strong conditioning by uh, syntactic context. Third person uh, starts uh, in the inversion contexts and then uh, spreads via the straight verb second to uh, the verb final uh, context, where second person is <coughs> first used um, almost exclusively. And then we've seen this uh, geographic uh, <coughs> diffusion pattern and uh, we've seen that women uh, seem to lead this change. Uh, what is very striking is this, uh, this uh, great influence of the syntactic position. So there's really something linguistic behind this. It's not just people using some epistolary forms and they don't really know what they mean, right? Uh, and this really looks a lot like position-dependent agreement in uh, present-day Dutch, where um, you, in an inversion context, have a different form of the verb with second person singular than uh, in a straight verb second context. So it's ben je, but je bent. Okay, in some dialects, uh, you also have this with first person plural. Um, which uh, Jan Walter Swart in his dissertation has analyzed as um, asymmetric verb second, where the verb is, the final verb is in different uh, positions. Uh, it's in a higher position in inversion context and in a lower position in uh, straight verb second context. Um, Ketan Posma actually blames the rise of uh, position dependent agreement with the new pronoun ye, which I said comes from the plural originally, um, on the loss of du. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I would go quite so far, but what he says is um, do uh, could only be in, uh, or the verb could only be in one position with do, uh, and with he it could be in both, uh, in, in a higher and a lower position in the left periphery. Uh, and uh, he f bases this on a geographic correlation uh, between dialects that have preserved do and dialects uh, that uh, have position dependent agreement whether in the first or in the second person. Okay. Now, the problem for us is that my data look like as if position-dependent agreement is lost because we go to a uniform, uh, everything is third person regardless of the position of the verb. right? Um, and that's perhaps not what we want to say. We don't want to claim that within 100 years or even less, uh, people innovated position-dependent agreement with yay and then abolished it with U. 
Um, uh, by the way, uh, I, I don't think POSMA is 100% right about the loss of do because uh, it's possible to have a do system with position dependent agreement because middle ajam is such a line. Um, so, what I would like to propose is that uh, the original system with the second uh, or with the position dependent agreement uh, reflects um, a use where this epistolary form of address. Uh, really uh, has the second person agreement uh, from the underlying uh, play pronoun, okay? Uh, and you have it where the pronoun is in the specifier of the head where the verb is, okay? And you get elsewhere third person agreement where there's no spec head agreement or where there's no spec head relation, namely when the verb is in a higher position than the subject. Um, and then um, we could uh, go with for the hack and say, okay, the, the use of U as a subject is really like Hünlopen, it's a reanalysis of the oblique form. Uh, and it, ke it keeps the underlying Che agreement. Okay? Um, right. And then uh, I would propose that, thank you, um, I would propose that. Uh, uh, during the 17th century, the uh, subject U is reanalyzed as a pronoun requiring third person agreement throughout. Um, and here, perhaps, there is an influence of the, of the epistolary forms. I don't know. Um, so perhaps both for the hacker and uh, for the host are right. Okay. Um, and then once this change from a uh, pronoun requiring second person if it's in a spectator relation to a pronoun uh, requiring a third person agreement uh, is complete, it can uh, diffuse also to the lower position. This is why it, it occurs on this late in uh, embedded flow. Um, right, and then by looking at the, uh, or from looking at the, at the uh, gender variation, I would say that, uh, okay, this is like really soon after uh, U is uh, start as, or people started using U as a subject pronoun, so there is no sociolinguistic stratification yet, there is no, um, uh, yeah, uh, standard uh, judgment yet on uh, how you should use it, okay? And this is why uh, women lead this change, because it's not uh, as, uh, a, a sanctioned form, okay? Now, uh, this change is never completed, and um, now we have this fossilization uh, of um, which lexical item prefers third or second person. So you have a, a preference for second person with to be, but uh, a preference for third person uh, with uh, have. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderfully timed talk. Um, do we have any questions? Well, you, you, just, you, you, you said this, no doubt, but I was so trying to understand the Dutch that uh, <laughs> uh, probably didn't know this. So the newspaper, the Gazette yeah. that you studied, they, they didn't tell us very much as compared to the letters. I mean, no. The, the, the progressive forms were absent or couldn't really be... Not entirely absent. Um, there's five of them. Um, in uh, two in inversion contexts and three in embedded clauses. Yeah. Seven. It's yeah, but it's uh, overall I have seven six. Um, and this would be showing this disparity between the two groups of text. That I think it shows that sec it, it shows more robustly that second mm -hmm. person is older.
like starts in in um, inversion contexts in many courses, right? Yeah. So and then it doesn't spread into embedded courses until quite later on. Yes. In the school. So what do you say? I mean, it's there is variation. You you find uh, in the whole corpus you find second person also in embedded clauses uh, early on. Okay, so you have eight. Uh, sorry, you have. Sorry, a third person uh, and second person in both contexts, in uh, all three contexts, you see that? But uh, the frequency changes, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, in inversion contexts, you already have very much less, uh, yeah, let's yeah. say, uh, third this person. This is for main clauses, right? Uh, Inver yeah, inversion means uh, main clauses okay. with something else than the subject. <laughs> yeah, Straight yeah. means uh, main clauses with uh, the subject yes. initial. And end means embedded clauses. Oh, okay. And, but sorry, then it was mean of, okay, yeah. It's the position of the verb. So uh -huh. where, where's the verb? Uh -huh. So would you say, I mean, please don't think you're my data, but like, would you say this is because of the position of the verb in embedded clauses, or would you connect this potentially to embedded clauses being more archaizing than main clauses generally? Um, that is a big question. That's something that is often said, but... Um, uh, I think, I don't know, what, what I now proposed was uh, that in both in embedded clauses and in straight uh, verb second clauses, the verb, uh, sorry, the, the subject is in the specifier of the head uh, mm -hmm. position of the verb. And uh, in inversion context, they're not in the same production. But, yeah, yeah. I, w I wouldn't... Okay, so I wouldn't go so far, but it's true that uh, also with negation, for instance, uh, neg uh, sorry, embedded clauses tend to be slower. And uh -huh. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's just, you know, it has been said, and at least yes. that's what I find in my data, so I do wonder to what extent, like, cross-linguistically, we could claim that... I think it's a uh, cross-linguistically robust finding yes. that extends across phenomena. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the opposite has been shown as well, so, yeah, okay, thank you. Any more comments? If not, thank you very much again.
challenge to that. Thank you so much. Uh, just talk, uh, uh, we were just talking about German influence. So here it is. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you so much for the for the invitation. I am so happy to be here. I've learned a lot in the last uh, to the last two days, and it is a pleasure to uh, present my work to this audience. So I will talk about narration. And if you're talking about narration, fairy tales, narrative texts come to mind. But I don't want uh, to, uh, to talk about fairy tales but I want to talk about an intra-textual intra distinction. So my starting point is kind of this distinction between narration and dialogue in the, inside the text. We uh, also see this in, uh, in the literature. There is a, a much work about dialogue and narration, the distinction between, and also questions like, is which is co more conservative or more progressive than that? So that's this kind of the frame of my, uh, my talk today. And this is my agenda. I want to talk briefly what is a narration. Um, I, uh, and then I want to present two case studies in order to, um, to, yeah, to present this. And then we can discuss about uh, the influence of narration on language change or syntax change. So let's talk about, I briefly will say something about narration. So as I said before, we can, of course, narration, uh, if it, uh, we can talk about the macro structure of different texts. Uh, uh, you, um, you might be familiar with the, uh, with the model by Labov and Valetsky. So according to Labov and Valetsky, La uh, um, texts like with uh, this kind of macrostructure, orientation, complication, resolution, coda, would be narrative texts. So if we should look in, into a text, kind of all this uh, story of Little Red, Red Riding Hood would be a narrative text. So more interesting for um, linguists is this: is if we zoom in the text and try to distinguish between this, uh, the, this uh, distinction between dial uh, dialogic and narrative passages. So we are on the level of modes of discourse, and um, you see here um, the narrative passages. And but I want to say it's uh, what I'm looking at. It's not just the distinction between narrative and versus dialogue, so direct speech, because also in direct speech we have have nested in kind of narrative, uh, narrative passages. So this is kind uh, more kind of the distinction Carlotta Smith has made, uh, talking about discourse modes, narration versus argumentation, description, replay. So I will use this for this talk today. We, of course, can also zoom in in these passages and uh, looking at discourse relations, so relations between different utterances, the co uh, coordination, uh, so uh, coordinating re relations between different events. And um, then we would just mark those two instances. So, um, yeah, to sum, sum this up, we can make dis different distinctions of different levels of the text. And um, that's why I'm talking about this dif uh, different dimensions of narration. But today I will just talk about the um, level of uh, modes of discourse. So as an interim conclusion, I see narration as a multi-level phenomenon which shows up on different levels of language. And um, I see narration as a covered category. That means it's characterized by, by a specific grammatical pattern. So why is this important for syntactic change? Let's look at these two case studies. First is left dislocations in Middle High German. So, of course, in order to trace a curve of evolution, you need diachronic data. And I'm on it, but it's work in progress. So I, today I will focus on Middle High German. But of course, I will look, uh, look backwards, I will look forward, and then we, uh, we also will look at the curve of evolution. So, um, Middle High German, um, you, uh, and you see here uh, uh, an example of the phenomenon I am interested in. So we have. The treasure, 
taken up by a D pronoun. It looks like the subject is represented twice. We have a resumptive D pronoun co-reference case agreement. There's also kind of a very similar structure like this. Um, so we see uh, it can also be taken up by a personal pronoun instead of a D pronoun. There's also distant positioning of the, of the pronouns. There can be a small pause between uh, those two units, so there's a little bit less integration. Um, for the historical data, it's very difficult to distinguish between these two. And uh, well, there are several terms in order to make this distinction. For my data, it's, it's not that relevant, so I will just talk about left dislocations uh, on these two examples. But 1D is extremely rare for my corpus. More relevant is another distinction, namely that between complex left dislocations and um, uh, simple left dislocations, because the diachronic uh, development differs for both cases. So we see that um, in the, uh, the complex left dislocations, they are obligatory, so we have to use them. For the others, there's free variation. I show you uh, one example that uh, what's the difference. We just saw one example of the simple uh, left dislocations. The other are more complex. We have an uh, NP, and there's kind of relevant, uh, relative clauses. And in um, example two, you have to use the D pronoun. Yeah, no, there's no way leaving it out. A great translation. Oh, um, the. Um, it's not that relevant. You just need you have an MP, and there comes relev uh, relative clauses. The, the the content is completely irrelevant for this case. It's just like you see uh, for. Uh, um, I will show you translations afterwards. S uh, so. <laughs> I'm reassured. <really sure. laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so I. Uh, uh, for now, it is important. I will focus on the free variation because this is just interesting whether there's a pattern or not. This other is obligatory for this, uh, uh, this kind of thing. Left dislocations are also uh, interesting because they're kind of features uh, seen as features <coughs> for all of uh, all syntax, and they're supposed to be closer to um, to, uh, to occur more frequently in texts that are closer to spoken language. So. Um, but what I did was I took uh, two different texts, they are narrative texts, but they have kind of a different media, um, uh, media constellation. There's a difference in, in the history between heroic epic and courtly epics. So the heroic epics are kind of closer to the, to the oral tradition, so they, they are transmitted orally, while courtly epics are already re relying on the written word. So, and um, there's a literary uh, tradition uh, in order to describe this difference. And I, I was interested, is this reflected in the linguistic features? So if you um, uh, do a linguistic comparison, what, ca uh, what can you see? I used a model um, uh, by Adel and Hennig, which is kind of uh, famous in the German tradition. It's based on the distinction between co uh, uh, by Koch Österreicher between language uh, of proximity and language of distance. And it's kind of, but, but uh, it's more you can really calculate kind of a degree of orality using this um, using this formula. And um, yeah, if we apply the scheme, you you, uh, you, uh, you see we have twenty eight uh, uh, degree of orality of twenty eight percent. And it's higher than Tristan, so it's exactly what we would uh, uh, would, uh, uh, would assume. Uh, however, this kind of figure is not uh, is is not that important. More important is if we look and um, if we um, cut, see what features are in the text, we can compare the different features. So that is more interesting than saying uh, twenty eight <laughs> per, um, percent or something like that. And what was very striking is. These uh, left displacements, since they're kind of features of oral syntax, I would have, uh, would have assumed that they show up in dialogical contexts. But actually, they're here in narrative passages. Um, that might be because of the sample was very small. Uh, small. So I uh, looked at the whole text. Uh, I compared the Nibelungenlied and the Tristan. And we, uh, 
can see here the, um, the, diff the, the, the effect is not as drastic as uh, on the slide before, but you can see if we, this is the speech density, so we would assume if this was uh, equally distributed, um, there, there were 60% in the narrative passages, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's more. So uh, yeah, you can see what's going on there in the narrative passages. Um, it's also interesting the frequency, uh, uh, there, um, there are left dislocations of you more in Tristan, although it's less oral, so there's no linear um, dependency between the, le the, the um, uh, distribution of the left, left displacement and the degree of orality. So let's look in the data. Uh, what, um, here, uh, yeah, it's, it's used in this narrative passages to reactualize uh, some protagonist which is introduced in the story. You also, I, I show you the manuscript because you also see there's m the marked initial with the red color, so it's kind of a scene shift we are, uh, we, we are looking here. So the treasure of the Nibelungen, it were, um, was carried out. Um, there's another example, you see the same pattern in the ma ma manuscript and it's uh, like uh, in many languages, uh, those, those left displacements are used in order to pick out a discourse reference from a pre-established set there has been uh, introduced. Several kings were attending a festive event and now it, um, it, it, the text goes on, the king of Denmark. So um, this is the pattern for the Nibelungen lead. If you look at the Tristan, interestingly, it's a little bit different, not that different, but we see here a combination with this, uh, with this particle mu which is used to introduce a new set, uh, a, a new step on the, um, in the uh, in a, a new scene shift or an, another event that's going on, and we have this this pattern now a proper name and then uh, uh, left the the key pronoun and that it's added something. So we have a kind of a new pattern of discourse uh, progression uh, which we can see here. And this, uh, um, yeah, this might be some new pattern in order to, uh, to mark explicitly the scene shift. So trying to trace the curve of evolution, uh, we can summarize that there is a global line of development leading to the degrees of left, dis place, uh, left displacements in the whole history of Germany. However, the distribution of left displacements uh, vary in the, varies in the different types of text. So there's no direct correlation, for example, between the orality decree and the frequency of these left, left displacements. And um, narration seems to display its kind of its own curve of development. And we have this progression um, from implicit to explicit marking in order to, uh, to mark the scene shifts. So, okay, so this, is the, this was the first case study. So no, now we come to the past perfect. And uh, we all know that, uh, we know from the literature that tense is very sensitive to this kind of, to, to this distinction between narrative and dialogues. For example, um, Bonvinist, who claimed that we have two complementary systems, uh, he, he, can, he can distinguish uh, Smith, Fludenik, um, Fleischmann, um, different. He um, can read about it in the literature. I can also show you here the, fi uh, uh, the figures. So there's, um, we see there's kind of a complementary system with uh, respect to the tenses. The preterite and uh, 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 pluperfect show up in the narrative passages and we have present and uh, perfect in the dialogical passages. Kind of a very clear, uh, uh, clear pattern. Um, just to remind you what I, uh, what I um, define as narrative versus tactic. So in the narrative, we have a um, distant context where different events are taking place and they're related temporally to each other. While in the didactic pattern, each event is kind of uh, linked to the didactic rebuild without explicitly marking the temporal, uh, the temporal relation. So based on uh, Smith here. So why is tense so sensitive in order, um, with respect to this distinction between the narrative and the non-narrative pattern? I think we can compare it like to uh, a chemical, chemical substances. If we imagine uh, discourse modes as a chemical substance, uh, you can take narrative or dialogue. Then we put in the tense and either nothing happens 
or we have kind of a chemical re re uh, reaction. Mm -hmm. So if we uh, put in the, the present perfect in a non-narrative pattern, it kinds of it's it's natural habitat, so nothing happens. But for example, we have have a restriction. If we put the perfect in the uh, narrative pattern, it just doesn't work. We have, we have no instances in this time of um, in this period of time for perfect in narrative passages. Um, for the past per perfect, it's the same. It works fine in the narrative pattern, but it doesn't in the non-narrative pattern. And my hypothesis is, is that in these instances, uh, some new um, kinds of uh, semantic, uh, some there can be innovation for semantic change. So there is just a mismatch. Something new happens. So yeah, let's look shortly on this pure perfect. The pure perfect is um, generally considered as a quite straightforward tense form, um, event for reference time for speech time. Uh, so uh, after he had done something, he, he did something else. Or here, when they had heard that, then, then spoke the knight or the lion. So, um, uh, but the, um, in, mo in present, um, <coughs> In, uh, in modern German, we have also kind of these instances like wir waren auf Mallorca gewesen, with a past perfect, which kind of seems uh, like it's a normal past. We could also use the, the present perfect or, or a preterite. So what's going on? Bertinetto speaks of our weakening, so the, the reference point, it kind of weakens, right? So, um, so what's happening there? You can see here on the slides, we just have no, not many instances of um, pure perfects in these dialogical passages. But there are a few, if we are looking for it. So we have this, uh, uh, this rare occurrence. What have you heard, good uncle, that you could believe that? And what happens is also kind of an hour weakening in this, um, in this context. It's still a pure perfect, I, uh, but um, well, there's no actual reference point in the context, so we have this. Uh, this impression we could also substitute by a, um, by a present perfect. And so I looked for, uh, uh, for those instances in first and second person and in not, not narrative. There are not that many. But if we compare it, we see if in all these occurrences, the um, cases of our weakening are rather rare. But in the first and second person, they are quite, uh, <coughs> uh, quite frequent. And they are the most frequent in the not narrative sense. Thank you. So, um, yeah, we, we see here this the tendency, and it co seems quite uh, s seems this way that the not narrative context kind of triggers this um, this kind of arbitrary. In, or, um, in order to make a comparison, I show you the data from um, uh, uh, from new media. So the functional distribution of the pure perfect in WhatsApp <coughs> chat and blogs, and you have uh, seen here the, uh, the um, the distribution. So the red ones, these are the cases with, t uh, with TR weakening. And we see they're the most frequent in the WhatsApp corpus. Um, and in the chat and blogs, they also appear, but not that, uh, not that many. So e every text type has its own pattern. But uh, so why are they that f is, um, this frequent in the WhatsApp corpus? I checked them manually and it also has a dependency with this um, di distinction between <coughs> narrative and dialogic passage, uh, pas um, passages. In WhatsApp, you do not have a lot of space in order to narrate something. Most of these instances are just like this communicative context where you tell some, uh, uh, somebody some, uh, something, or uh, I had forgotten this, or something like that. And these are these contexts where the um, where the R weakening can be triggered. So it kind of explains what's, uh, what's going on here and can, comp uh, can explain the difference between this di uh, these different mm -hmm. text types that, uh, that we have here. And I think this is kind of the same what's going on in the older uh, stages of, uh, of German. We have this di difference between dialogic passages and narrative passages. And in this uh, dialogic context, our weakening can, can happen. And what kind of s s looks like a very new development, like these, uh, these instances of um, Ich war auf Mallorca gewesen, they are kind of uh, seen as a new development in the, in the history of German, which happens, happened very recently. I think they are kind of a, a 
further development from something that actually was innovated uh, a long time, long time ago, or does have to do with this pattern. Looking back here, the, the non-narrative pattern and the narrative pattern. Um, I, if I'm right, we uh, we can assume that we have kind of two different de developments, so kind of two different grammaticalization pathways, but the uh, we didn't see it before because the instances are very rare and kind of do not show up in our data. Just if you're uh, looking for these rare cases, what's happening in the uh, non-narrative pattern there. So in the narrative pattern, kind of um, not that much change is going on. The pluperfect has already in the uh, in the order stages of uh, language a lot of different functions which are not uh, all um, documented in our grammar books. So we have kind of a functional consistency, um, but I think also we have a, a, a earlier focus shift from state to event, so it does not uh, kind of go totally parallel to the um, present perfect. And with in the non-narrative pattern, we have these cases of R weakening, and I think also we have kind of this development of factive readings. If I say, um, Ich bin auf Mallorca gewesen, I have been to Mallorca. It does not mean I have been there, but I was really there, I assure you. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a kind of this, uh, this fact of reading involved. Mm -hmm. And I also think this is kind of a development which is, um, uh, which is related to this context where the form is used. So also tracing here the curve of evolution. Mm -hmm. um, the development of the blue perfect runs differently within the two discourse modes, narration and report. And um, yeah, this, this suggests that discourse modes can trigger different grammaticalization pathways out of the same course, uh, source constructions which we have. Mm. So um, yeah, this is my last slide. I have a third point, syntactic <laughs> change through narration, but I was kind of foreseeing that I'm at the end of my talk. So I would like to uh, discuss this with you in the discussion and just say thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Thank you very much, Sonia. It's very interesting. Um, uh, you refer to Asher and Mascarida. Mascarida? How do you pronounce that last name? Mascarida? Let's just assume. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so when you talk about narration in the rest of your talk, is that the narration in their sense, or did you? No, um, I'm referring to the distinction mm -hmm. between narration and uh, on the level of discourse mode. So, this uh, the definition of narration of Lascarides, uh, Asher Lascarides is more restrictive. So only an iconic word order, yeah. then and then and then, yeah. would count as a narration. And um, I think this is important for syntactic change too, but I didn't show it today. Um, but I was uh, oh, yeah. referring to, the, uh, to, this, uh, to this level of language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, like that. I wrote a paper once where I used the Asher and Lascarides model. It's oh. an interesting exercise to do with the narration of narration, yeah. etc. Oh, I would be very interested yeah. in that. Okay. I had a question about the left dislocations. You had a slide where the left dislocation, there's examples of left dislocation to indicate new narrative scenes or something mm -hmm. like that. And I wondered if you could tell us what the, what the topic was before the token in each of those examples. Yeah, um, uh, which, uh, which one were you uh, referring? This one or the later? Uh, well, later? This one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, these, uh, so those these are, ones. Um, those are all very interesting, right? You've got, yeah. you've got now, which is a discourse marker. Yes, right. So what was happening? I'm wondering what, what happened <coughs> right before that in terms of discourse topic. As, so it's kind of a scene shift. So the, um, it, uh, the story goes on and then kind of a little break. Mm -hmm. So this could be a time break. So um, uh, just uh, for example, the first example, um, it's kind of a, um, d d um, this, this journey he's, uh, uh, he's, he's taken and he comes to England. And uh, well, there's kind of a break, and then now he's on. Uh, he's in England, and then the the, the story story kind of starts anew, and um, then is so now, 
no, new scene, uh, new scene tri uh, Tristan, now he is at home and uh, or now he's ready and, and then a new, a new episode be uh, begins. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, I forgot to, to give you the, uh, the translation that I'm doing. Sorry. So have we been talking directly about Tristan right before, or have we taken a detour and we're coming back to Tristan? Yes, we are, we are coming back to yeah, Tristan. Okay. Yeah. And then a quick comment. So I've, I've done some work on leftist vocation and old romance, and you, I also, I don't think they're typical of speech. They're very common in them. They're not necessarily very oh, common, okay. but the that's, ones that I found were Oh, that's also, very interesting, yeah. You know, mostly, and I didn't analyze it, but I, impressionistically, I don't remember yeah, it being but, uh, but speech. I mean, here, it, uh, in the Tristan, it's kind <coughs> of uh, distributed <coughs> equally. Mm -hmm. I also looked at um, sermons, because uh, they have a lot of des uh, left dislo uh, dislocations, and I, want, um, uh, I want left displacements, and I wanted to see whether also they occur in the narrative passages, but it's kind of a, kind of a di completely different pattern. So um, yeah, they have different uh, different functions and different text types. Okay. As one I last see it. Question and then we may have. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> you want to? Yeah, I just uh, Ali wanted this uh, in uh, liberal German and in literature and legal texts. You have a lot of uh, cases where you have some uh, kind of conditional clause uh, before a main clause, and it's the the condition for the main clause. So it's mm -hmm. like if somebody does this and that, then. Mm -hmm. But instead of then or so or whatever relative you expect, you have a, a D pronoun which resumes a part of mm -hmm. the, like a reference inside the, um, the conditional clause. Ah, okay. Uh, so this yeah. is definitely not a very well uh, gender, yeah. Uh, yeah. genre, right? Um, and uh, it's some kind of partial resumption. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this is very, uh, very interesting and also kinds of. Um, Reminds me to um, of the sermons, where mm -hmm. kind of a diff um, different pattern. And I mean, these are so interesting because it uh, just seems that every uh, uh, they can be used in different functions according to the, the relevant text type. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay, one last thing. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm going to to, uh, to ask you a question which uh, links up to what we talked about uh, in the uh, in the preceding. Uh, Presentation. Uh, uh, example number six here. Uh, am I right that it means that now Tristan has, uh, who has arrived uh, home? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So um, this is a composed uh, form which would um, often be the, uh, appear in, uh, in epic, um, in epic uh, songs where the the main line of the narration is made in the present tense, which is a historical, mm -hmm. uh, historical present, and then the, the, the composed past here is indicating something that happened just before. So in, indeed, it's the same pattern that we fi find in dialogues, but it, it's used in uh, narration. Yeah. And uh, so, so the, the division that we have with uh, Van Lins, um, mm -hmm. and, and Van Lins, uh, has yeah. made the same uh, division between narration and, and discourse, um, then it means that you can switch in, uh, in uh, when you use the, the historical present, uh, present tense uh, instead of the past tense. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that breaks down the, 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 the strict uh, division yeah. between <coughs> narration and, uh, and dialogue. And it also means that the, the, the composed form here is not necessarily a past, but it may be uh, um, a, a form of the a, a, a sort of the present that is that is finished. So it's it's an achievement. Mm -hmm. so yes, thank you so much for this remark, uh, and be, because uh, this kind of art. I think in these uh, changing the situations or the uh, in the scene shifts, we have kind of uh, often we have this kind of uh, that, that we have a combination of proximity and distance markers. Mm -hmm. So we have kind of proximity new, uh, which uh, can be used as kind of uh, referring, okay, now in the story, but also now in the on the discourse level, because I'm uh, I'm telling mm -hmm. the story and also trying to um, uh, trying to use this tense form with the 
better present or the pres um, present perfect. But interestingly, for example, past perfects can also occur in this environment. So mm. it's kind of mixing, mm. and it is, is it it is exactly in these scene shifts where kind where we kind of progressing of the story, but also. Uh, we we are drawing back to our discourse situation that a nar narrator actually tells the story, and it is uh, it is characteristic for those epics that we have a strong narrator and drawing back also to this uh, this uh, situation of narrating the story, and it's it's exactly what you described what's happening here.
good? I'll just send to you like an empty email if you can be Is it dip? Get it? Yeah. Hello, it's just a reply. It's an automatic reply to my automatic uh, Okay, so it's not. Uh, so no, I haven't got it yet. Yeah. If you go back, if maybe he, he will have received this email. So if you just reply to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I'm No, no, it works. Okay. No, that's not that. That's a, the formal one. Okay. <laughs> so it worked. It's, it takes yeah, you, it it takes it time, yeah, but we'll get there. So the important thing is that you have it. So and now, now should I plug this here in? Yes, you can. Yeah. I'll find the story. Yeah, I'm 
présentation.
a note on the program that there would be drinks, and that's the drinks. <laughs> so, it's not compulsory, but those who want some. Is it now or is it after the talk? After the talk. During the talk. So, Sam, you are responsible for making sure everybody who wants some has some. Has a bottle. You do have to know more. Well, we have to respect the tradition. Maybe the speaker wants some, sir. Uh, okay, well, let's, uh, should we start again? For this final presentation, um, of a man who doesn't need any presentation. So I will dispense with that and invite you immediately to tell us what you thought about what you heard and what you thought about your own work. So, join us, Karatek, please. Thanks a lot, Pierre. Uh, thank you, you will be speaking for about... About two hours, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Because I know, I know that you're all, we are all tired, and this, this have, uh, I'm really so full of ideas now. This is, uh, have been two very rich days with many, many interesting talks. And um, especially after Afra's talk yesterday, I thought, yeah, she explained the concepts and made everything clear. So, in fact, we could cancel my talk uh, <laughs> today. And, and some people said, ah, you will have to wrap it up tomorrow. So it's, uh, I, I don't think I will be able to do that. I will just tell a few words about uh, discourse traditions. The, 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 the tradition of having a, a strong drink, like a cognac now. Uh, is that a tradition here? It, is that... Ah, it's Calvados. Pardon, pardon, pardon. I, I used to be... Uh, I used to um, um, be an evaluator of the uh, Humboldt Foundation and they had the, 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 the tradition to offer a glass of whiskey at five o'clock in the afternoon after a whole day of evaluating proposals and all the proposals <laughs> that were evaluated after the whiskey passed much uh, easier <laughs> than uh, the ones before. So uh, this is also a tradition. We'll talk about tradition. <clears throat> and uh, uh, in fact, uh, yeah, uh, discourse traditions, uh, to make it a little bit more complicated, we talked about style, text type, genre, uh, register, subtypes, uh, subgenre, uh, and now I'm even uh, uh, introducing another concept that is quite common in Romance linguistics in certain traditions. Um, Raymond Wilhelm is here who wrote a lot about discourse traditions and others uh, who are in the room mentioned uh, the, the notion. Um, it's very common in German um, uh, Romance linguistics And it spread beyond, um, due to the work of Peter Koch and Wolf Österreicher, basically, um, uh, especially to Spanish um, uh, linguistics, also to Brazilian um, um, Portuguese uh, linguistics. There is a whole branch of people who work on discourse traditions in, in Brazil, for example. But it's kind of not a general notion. It's more restricted to uh, certain areas. What I will do now is to just present shortly the, the, the concept of discourse tradition for those who uh, have maybe not heard about it. Um, I will propose a few modifications and then talk about the relationship between discourse traditions and historical uh, syntax. Um, and um, yeah, just uh, starting with uh, Peter Koch. Um, Peter Koch has been mentioned several times uh, during these two days and always uh, Koch Österreicher immediacy di distance or proximity as some people say but they prefer the authors, uh, authors preferred immediacy, uh, immédiat uh, in, uh, um, um, in, in uh, French. Uh, so Peter Koch who uh, died far too early in 2014 Uh, in his habilitation thesis in 1987 presented the concept of uh, discourse tradition. It was a, um, um, a, a work on the Ars, Ars Dictaminis in, in Old Italian um, and uh, in a way he needed the concept in order to describe his empirical object because it was about the history of the language but something was lacking in the uh, <coughs> Uh, in the current theories. So the, the, the backgrounds he refers to uh, explicitly is above all, the, the, the first background is mainly 
uh, Corsedius theory, um, implicitly it's British Leben Lange, also explicitly, uh, and uh, also explicitly the work, uh, the joint work with Wolf Österreicher. So this is a monumental um, uh, uh, work that has not been published yet, so it should really be published. We tried to do that, but there were kind of controversies among the disciples of Peter Koch, so uh, it has never been published. Um, <coughs> but we, everybody has it, so the people who, who work with it have it uh, in, in blind copies. Um, the, the first background is Cosserius theory, and what, what is Cosserius' main um, uh, distinction uh, of uh, his theory? Uh, I mean, this is probably uh, quite well known. Cosserius distinguishes three levels, the universal level of uh, speaking in general, which is common to all uh, to, to human language in general, then the historical language, uh, the historical level of languages uh, as uh, particular, particular historical entities like French, Spanish, uh, German, and the individual uh, level of discourse, which is, the, is the, 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 the only touchable level of the realization of uh, language. Um, and he further uh, distinguishes three aspects, uh, energia, dynamis and ergon, uh, which are of course uh, Humboldtian and Aristotelian terms. Um, uh, the, the activity, the energia side, uh, side on, the, on, on, the one, uh, on the one hand, and, and then the, the, the energia is conditioned by the dynamis, by the knowledge or competence, and then we have the product. And uh, in fact, we want to talk about energia, but what we have is, uh, for example, in Cobra, uh, is ergon, texts, a collection of texts which are the result of the energia. Um, and uh, in Koch's understanding, uh, the discourse on the individual, uh, individual level is a, a unique, um, um, is, 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 is just a unique uh, event, uh, utterance, that is irrepeatable. So it's, uh, uh, for him, there is something missing, the, aspect of the possibility of repeating uh, uh, texts. Um, Cosserio himself claims this distinction, this simple distinction of the three levels, to be his main contribution to the understanding of language and consequently to the foundation of linguistics, or um, to put it in other words, he says in 1985, one of the few texts in English, what constitutes my permanent frame of reference. Um, I won't go further into that quotation and uh, uh, skip again to uh, Koch's uh, work. These are uh, the original schemes, uh, uh, 80s, still with a typewriting a manuscript, a typewritten manuscript. Uh, on the left you see the uh, schematic representation of Corsario's idea of there is the activity uh, of, uh, of speaking on the general, general level. Uh, then there is the historical language, which would be the filter through which uh, speaking goes, and the result is the discourse uh, or the utterances. And uh, Peter Koch adds two uh, aspects to this uh, scheme. Um, um, on, uh, first, uh, he adds the discourse tradition, the discursive tradition, and then the individual language, uh, something that in Cosserius terms uh, doesn't exist. Um, uh, and, and then the result will be the discourse. Nobody has ever really insisted much on the uh, aspect of the individual language, which is really interesting. Everybody's just uh, uh, talking about discourse tradition, but that's uh, a, a, a problem of the reception of this uh, Koch theory. What does Koch say about discourse tradition? He says, appropriateness is not only oriented towards the idiosyncratic parameters of the respective individual discourse, but also towards the traditions in which this discourse stands. <coughs> on the one hand, these are of course the language norms, but on the other hand, somehow transversely, there are, they are, they are also certain discourse traditions which are intersubjectively valid as discourse norms and participate in the constitution of um, um, the respective meaning of a discourse. And now, text types, genres, styles, etc. Um, so this uh, clears everything, clarifies everything. Um, um, there are, uh, these are complexes of discourse rules which operate on the basis of the rules of speech as well as on the rules of language, but which, unlike the former, are not universal but, but historical and conventional, and unlike the latter, are precisely not 
or at best uh, coincidentally bound to language communities. We recognize here the genuine form of the historicity of discourse. This is the idea, uh, and it doesn't really clarify a lot in, uh, with respect to the terms we discussed here, because they appear all in one line. So, uh, uh, But we, uh, uh, we see here an idea that speaking is not only um, uttering something according to the rules of a language, uh, to, the gra to a grammar um, uh, uh, or a, a grammar and a lexicon of a language, but that it goes through, through, uh, through two filters, the filter of the language and the filter of uh, discursive traditionality. And uh, Koch says that this is something that, in a way, Coselio ignored in his conception of the language. I uh, wrote in s on several occasions that I don't agree with that because there are several writi writings by Coselio where he insists on the historicity of texts, uh, for example, he says in a uh, also unpublished uh, manuscript on uh, linguistic correction, we published it now online uh, uh, last year, but it's um, uh, not, not a real edition, it's just uh, the, the publication of a manuscript from the 50s. He says the interesting aspects of expressive competence, you remember expressive, the expressive level is the individual level, so the competence is the competence on the individual level, the interesting aspects are those that in both senses present a certain degree of generality. Such aspects may be historical or universal. They are universal if they have to do with the nature of humans or with human experience in general, and they are historical if they depend on historically determined spheres of uh, uh, experience of culture. This means that expressive content, uh, competence has its own universality and its own historicity. Um, and um, so then he, he uh, gives lots of examples of that. Uh, so the conception we find, and, and there is another text from uh, uh, 75 where he explicitly says, uh, talks about the double historicity of language, the historicity of the particular languages and that of the texts. So Cosetti was aware of the existence of a historicity of text, but I think he, um, he does not... Um, locate it uh, on the same level as uh, Peter Koch does, so it's not two filters uh, all a speaking is going through, but there is a kind of a historicity of the individual uh, utterance, so the, 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 uh, the, the ergon can be repeated, so there's kind of a, uh, a possibility of um, a repetition of texts, and that's m what, what makes this secondary historicity. He talks about secondary historicity in several on se several occasions. Uh, Corsario, as you know, was a structuralist who went beyond structuralism and uh, also criticized quite uh, 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 um, directly structuralist uh, approaches. And um, and Corsario, um, uh, was an anti-Chomskyan, very explicit anti-Chomskyan, but I think in our context this do doesn't really matter because uh, his ideas on textual tradition and in general the notion of discourse tradition we see in Peter Koch is completely compatible with uh, different approaches, also with a, a generativist uh, approach. Um, um, I think um, language is considered clearly as a system uh, in a primary historicity and there is a possible traditionality of texts that might interfere with the primary historicity but both are, uh, the, 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 the secondary historicity is, the, is, is secondary so it's, it's a kind of a, the repetition of uh, 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 erga uh, uh, comparable to other traditions. So in fact traditionality of texts or traditionality of language is not, nothing uh, special. It's not what makes language uh, be something really special. Language is special through his primary, through, through its primary historicity, that we live in language and that we only can think uh, linguistically and that we are creative uh, when uh, speaking. Um, the, 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 the possibility of referring to, to, to linguistic tradition is a secondary fact that is not uh, uh, restricted to language and it's comparable to traditions of, for example, of wearing a tie or uh, of uh, having tattoos or, uh, uh, or, or, uh, or certain gestures or other things, so the, the, the traditionality of language is not what defines uh, language in the, primary, uh, in the primary sense, but it interferes with uh, the, uh, um, the, the language as, with language as a 
primary fact. So, um, this is my first advertisement uh, in this context. <laughs> uh, 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 there's a chapter on this, on these uh, historicities, and, and uh, uh, in, in, in this uh, recent book on uh, Consiglio Beyond Structuralism, which is free, uh, freely downloadable uh, on the De Greuter site, so you can... And, and the other advertisement is the site Cosedio uh, uh, CH, where you can download almost all the, the writings, uh, uh, Cosedio's uh, writings. Okay, the, the second background, as I said, there are three backgrounds, is Brigitte Schlieben Langes, um, Tradition des Sprechens, a book published in 83. Um, Brigitte Schlieben Lange was kind of a... Uh, um, a, a mentor for Peter Koch. She introduced him to uh, Hans Martin Gauger in Freiburg and she was, uh, uh, had strong influence in him and she had published that book about traditionality of uh, texts, precisely on a, a kind of a, a sketch of a historical pragmatics, um, published in 83, and with many ideas that reappear then in the habilitation thesis uh, by Koch. <coughs> and the third background is Koch and Österreicher both uh, with uh, their famous uh, language of immediacy and language of distance, and this is what we already uh, saw um, on several occasions because it had, has been um, uh, repeatedly quoted here. So what is the, the, the model of language and, uh, of immediacy and distance? Um, uh, already yesterday we, we heard about it um, in, in Wendy's uh, 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 first talk. Um, that it's, it's a model that, that shows uh, um, um, kind of a universal dimension of speaking uh, between um, two poles um, that, and, and, and then it says in a, in a, a further version that the texts the, uh, that uh, the text can be located along this continuum between immediacy and distance. I won't go into the uh, parameters, these communicative parameters and uh, the, strategy, the strategies of textualization that uh, Koch and Österreicher elaborate on. Um, as you might know, in a further elaboration of the model, they also, this is mainly Österreicher's contribution, um, they, they uh, react to criticism that texts are not really on one line and, and, and then there are these uh, schemes where, according to the parameter, a text can be located more on the left or more on the right uh, of, the, of, of, of the scheme, so that texts are really uh, complex uh, um, entities that uh, have uh, not only linear uh, positions on that continuum. But what is important here is what uh, in Wendy's talk were letters, here it's Roman uh, uh, numbers, uh, from one to nine, uh, some of on, on, the, on the phonic level and the others on the graphic. You see that the two triangles represent more, more or less the frequency of the realizations of language of immediacy and of distance. So it's more likely to have distant texts in graphic uh, representations and more likely to have immediate uh, texts of immediacy in a phonic realizations. One would be kind of a personal conversation, and uh, nine would be something like a, an ele elaborate text, maybe a a legal text or a philosophical treatise or whatever. Um, so, and, and you have uh, lots of correlates of this, uh, of this uh, scheme and it is related, um, if we look at these Roman numbers, to Peter Koch's uh, idea of discourse traditions because in a way uh, this is the syn synchronic view on something that has a dichronic dimension if we look at the Roman numbers and their historicity. But let's first go um, before modifying the scheme and modifying uh, some uh, of, the, of the elements uh, to something um, very general and uh, important for our purpose here. Um, traditionally, or um, what, what the model criticizes is a, 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 a monographic or a, a homogeneous view on, on, on language and what, what the, the discourse tradition model uh, criticizes. Uh, we could consider the evolution of a language throughout time as an arrow, as a line, and then we say there is, for example, a generational innovation because children reorganize the language, and it's, but it's, it's kind of a continuous evolution with a language change uh, that can be located uh, on, uh, uh, along this line. 
And um, in fact, what we do when we do historical linguistics, uh, we work with uh, corpora that uh, represent um, texts, that are texts, and that we associate with uh, uh, synchronic moments along this di diachrony. So a corpus is a collection of texts, a, a language is in fact an abstract system of rules, uh, and even it's more complicated because we know a language is not a homogeneous uh, entity, there is a dia system of language with its varieties, and, uh, uh, and the text is a concrete utterance in a concrete setting. So what we are doing here is somehow using yeah, bad data for uh, uh, doing, um, at the end, good linguistics historically. Um, but the, 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 the basic idea is that we have representatives for certain synchronies. And so the ideal historical linguistic view would be just to, ch to choose any text from, uh, the, the, the only important uh, thing would be to have clear dates and to know when the texts were produced and then we can reconstru uh, reconstruct the diachrony. Um, I'm, we, we heard today, like Anne Breitbart said this uh, in, the, in the, 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 the heterogeneity of the corpus, we have a corpus where uh, uh, along the history of the, of the texts, the texts really change, so it's not really a homogeneous corpus. What is a homogeneous corpus? What is a representative corpus? That's one of the questions that uh, is really uh, uh, crucial for everything we have discussed here uh, during both uh, of these things. So this model uh, is to be criticized and it's going to be criticized via the notion of discourse tradition. Second advertisement, um, just to interrupt that from time to time, <laughs> to make you, um, we, we talked about Cobra and we, uh, 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 there, there is this, for if you are interested, because I'm basically working on Iberian Romance languages, and we created with uh, Juan Torrella uh, uh, from Barcelona this um, uh, portal um, de corpus históricos romanicos, which is a, a meta um, uh, page where you can find the corpora of historical, uh, the historical Iberian Romance uh, corpora. Okay, this is not an advertisement. <coughs> Uh, the, the probably largest project on historical syntax ever in a Romance language, or maybe in any language, I don't know other languages with uh, a more exhaustive project, is the one that is currently carried out by, uh, under the direction of Concepcion Compañía in Mexico. Um, she, uh, this project is the Sintaxis Histórica de la Lengua Española, uh, with uh, the first volumes on um, um, verbal uh, syntax coming out in 2006, and then uh, nominal syntax, and uh, then other volumes, and there are still three more coming out um, in uh, next year probably. Um, so at the end it will be like uh, 10, 11 or 12, I don't know exactly the number, uh, but it's like this. Uh, uh, quantity of books on historical syntax and you can find there everything um, and the, 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 the project is based on a, a, a so-called corpus base which is a, a very very small corpus with very few texts from different moments in the history of Spanish there even there is a whole century lacking, and there is uh, um, uh, uh, the, the texts are jumping from legal texts in the first. You have the tzit, uh, obviously, because it's with, with, with everything begins with the tzit. Then you have several legal texts in the 13th century, because that's what we have in the 13th century. Then from the 14th century onwards, of course, we have literature like the Conde Lucanor and other texts and. Kalila Edimna, which is uh, strangely a text of the uh, 13th century, and then we have literature, and then we have broader literature, there is the Quixote appearing, a text which is really representative for its synchrony, as we will see uh, later on, and then it switches to the Documentos Linguisticos de la Nueva España, which are administrative and legal documents uh, from the uh, 16th, 17th century onwards, and this helps us to reconstruct the diachrony of Spanish. So if you go back to the, uh, if you go back to the line and the scheme, uh, it's exactly according to that idea that the whole project is uh, constructed. Of course, there were people 
uh, collaborating that criticized the, the restrictedness of the corpus, which is only the corpus basit, so it's only the general orientation of everybody. Uh, so, but we know colleagues like Alvaro Octavio de Toledo uh, uh, just enlarged the corpus and multiplied it like by a hundred or something. And uh, uh, so he, uh, there are several works that work with much more texts, um, but uh, uh, um, um, much more texts or many more texts. Um, but uh, uh, in fact, the, the, the basic idea is that the texts are representative of their. Uh, uh, respective synchronies and there's not too much of a difference. We will see later that that is a problem for the authors and that many of the authors criticize or even not criticize but they comment on problems they have when they describe the diachrony and that's why Concepcion Compagni asked uh, uh, Araceli Lopez and myself to write a paper on discourse tradition and historical syntax of Spanish and this it will appear in the next uh, in the last volume, and it's kind of a criti criticism of everything that is in the <laughs> other volumes. <laughs> uh, but, uh, not a but it's, of course, constructive, constructive. So, the first modification, the first modification is um, uh, just a very simple one. I simply propose to turn around the scheme and to have a distance above and immediacy below, and so I can introduce time, as we know time goes from left to right, um, <laughs> uh, at least in our culture, um, and this allows us to introduce um, a first representation of discourse tradition, so a, a diachrony would not anymore be one line, but uh, uh, several superposed lines with uh, uh, their respective traditions. This is, of course, uh, and then there could be like uh, contact between these traditions and uh, uh, so linguistic phenomena could spread from one textual tradition to another. Um, I think we saw um, some of the examples. If you think of, uh, for example, uh, Charlotte uh, was talking about the Gazeta in two different centuries with uh, the, the Gallegos uh, example with uh, similar um, uh, characteristics, even if it's uh, uh, diachronically distant, but there is, there is something, and we saw the same thing uh, with Chronicles and with other um, um, texts. Of course, this is far too simplified, but it is one uh, possible uh, criticism of the two uh, simplistic uh, single line. Of course, it's not lines, and of course, it's not like that. But uh, we could imagine, we can imagine that apart from the diachrony, there is kind of a, a knowledge of how to uh, speak or write in this or that occasion. So this is already um, a step forward. Um, but um, what are we going to do with the following? This is um, an example that is taken, maybe better don't read the, the, the English trans the translation because the text is rather stupid. But um, the, 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 the important thing is here is like it was like uh, um, 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 b before we had also the, the, the translation doesn't it doesn't matter like in Sonia's uh, presentation. Now um, what is important here? This is a, 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 um, a passage from the Conde Lucanor, a literary text uh, w which is narrative in part. Um, it's kind of a dialogue between. Uh, the uh, Count Lucanor and Padronio. It's a, uh, a, a text that is in a, in a uh, kind of a tradition of wisdom literature, as Prosa uh, Sapienzella. I don't know how to translate that into English, but in, in, in fact, it's, it's a literary um, uh, tradition connected to um, a, a very, very old uh, tradition that's coming from India and uh, passing to, through the Arabic tradition to uh, Spain. That doesn't matter now, but what is interesting is that we have in the middle of this text uh, just the, the following. Finco for, por Fazzania, que si el marido dice que el corre el río contra arriba, que la buena mujer lo debe creer y debe decir que es verdad. And this is just exactly a quotation of a fuero text. Uh, you have a, a, fue, a fuero is a, is a legal text, or a Fazzania, um, um, which is a... Um, 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 it's a, it's a legal tradition, the popular legal legal tradition of of, of the, uh, um, the 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 uh, case law uh, on on the uh, Iberian Peninsula, and there exist collections of these texts, which are basically lists of conditional um, um, 
uh, of, of, of conditions that say when you if you do this uh, that w uh, or that will happen and there is a kind of a, there is a syntactic structure behind that and in the middle of this Conde Lucanor you have this quotation and it says even uh, Finco por Fazzania so Fazzania is one of the the the, the, the names that uh, evocates really this tradition so all the readers or the, the, the people in the 14th century know exactly that this is referring to the legal tradition of the 13th or even uh, uh, the earlier tradition. So what we have is, is that in the middle of a text something appears that is referring to a tradition, but it's not a text that's a legal text, it's a completely different text. So what, we're, what, what are we going to do with this? Um, we were talking about global traditions, about texts that have their, uh, that are uh, as a whole a part of tradition, and we could say that the Conde Lucanor is part of a narrative tradition or w w whatever. But now we have in the middle of this text something that is an allusion to a legal text, and it's really quo uh, a quotation, it's playing with the legal tradition. So what I propose then, uh, at a certain moment, after a long discussion about what is uh, uh, genre, what is uh, uh, text type, whatever, um, that the whole discussion about discourse tradition suffers from a problem of perspective. We start from certain categories um, uh, of repeated or repeatable elements, like types, genres, uh, registers, and then ask which discursive tradition appears in each case. However, from the moment we start from the point of view of such categories, the view towards the process of categorization itself is blocked. So what I propose is to just turn the whole thing around and say, we don't look what a text type we have or what genre we have uh, w uh, in order to make the, 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 the term discourse tradition really um, uh, powerful, we should just invert the perspective and look for tradition, uh, traditionality in texts. This is of course an easy proposal and not so easy to uh, 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 carry out empirically but, or, or practically, but at least it's it makes sense because that's what we have empirically. So, and um, now that I've just criticized the categories, um, I propose a couple of categories. Um, but these are uh, emergent categories of, of uh, discourse traditions, and they could be. Uh, I, I would propose to distinguish formal uh, categories and categories of content. Um, and these, this is an open list because they are emergent uh, categories. That, that, so you discover traditionalities in text, and you say this must be, this could be called this or that. And I propose to distinguish discursive forms, zones, or and formula, um, and then also on the side of the content, uh, the discursive domain, discursive theme, and discursive motive. Because there is no reason to separate formal. Uh, and uh, it, there's a reason of separating uh, or distinguishing formal and uh, content aspects, but there are traditions of content, of saying something, uh, like motives or uh, certain uh, um, um, themes, and there are also traditions of forms. So, what is a discursive form? It's a combination of form and formal elements in a text, like we have the form of the charter, we have certain chronicles, we have a sonnet as a form, we have narrative text, we just heard about uh, one of the examples uh, uh, was uh, Labov and Valetsky's uh, classification or Smith or other uh, attempts to, to cope for what a narrative text is. Um, and often but not always these uh, uh, formal uh, categorization appears in combination with similar discursive theme uh, uh, or with a, a particular discursive domain. Discursive domain is something that in other uh, theories uh, uh, appears as, um, as um, uh, discursive universals or universe of discourse, like the difference between a root in mathematics, in linguistics or in um, um, botanics. Um, <coughs> The, the, the discursive zone, I think this has been referred to several times uh, during the two days, is the place in the text where uh, a traditional can be uh, located. And I think this is absolutely crucial to not only look at texts <coughs> globally, but to look at the texts uh, uh, in their, um, in their uh, um, horizontality. Pierre mentioned the case of a quotation within uh, a text, we have sometimes texts that really are composed of several subtexts and that are 
uh, uh, also grammatically different that represent different diachronies, for example, or, or different uh, diatopies. Um, uh, the, this, the, 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 this is a very well known, the very well known example, for example, for, of, of charters that uh, have a, a me medieval text that uh, at the beginning have a formal like beginning. Uh, e even if you look at the, 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 the relationship between Latin and Romance in these uh, in, in medieval texts, the first, like the, the Occitan charters that start with the uh, in certain sections of the text, the, Roma, the, the, the Occitan is just coming in and then it's spreading. Um, there, there were several there, there are several works on that, and in the last years, uh, uh, lots of uh, lots of, uh, a lot of work on discursive zone has appeared. Um, this is uh, an example by uh, um, a work by Celia Lopes. We tried to represent the horizontality of texts with uh, this kind of schemes. Uh, she worked on uh, address forms in Brazilian Portuguese in the 19th century. And she showed that the the, the innovative form Bosse is uh, you have here the two forms in the, uh, 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 the the blue ones and the red ones are the Bosse forms, and that they are just in the marginal uh, the, the marginal zones of letters. In that case, uh, the innovative form is uh, uh, entering uh, more and more. Uh, it can be at the beginning, at the end, but it's normally restricted to cert certain zones and then it spreads uh, uh, throughout the text. And of course, diachronically, if you only count both A and 2, you will get a kind of a curve, uh, but in fact this curve is stratified or is um, more differentiated if you look a little bit closer at the text. We did the same thing with medieval texts, uh, with a little bit more um, complicated analysis of uh, clause combining elements. Um, um, we made uh, an inventory of clause combining elements and we, uh, with the hypothesis that the combination of clause combining elements uh, was more or less an indicator or a symptom for uh, different textual traditions. This was a work on, uh, basically first a work on legal texts in the uh, uh, Spanish 13th century where I distinguished three completely different uh, legal traditions. I just mentioned the fazanias on the one hand, which are cases that are described. Then you have the case law with the fueros, which are referring to these cases, but they have abstract uh, um, uh, laws. And then you have the Roman law with its meta law and all the uh, uh, um, um, all the the, the 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 whole description of the legal system that is completely different because it's, uh, it, it needs uh, for m um, much more complexity in the syntactic uh, um, organization. And in the Conde Lucanor, for example, this is an example from the Conde Lucanor, you can observe that there are zones uh, within the text that uh, are constructed uh, quite uh, differently. Discursive formula, this is something we all know, of course. Uh, um, we just heard the, the beginning of uh, the presentation, the once upon a time uh, example. Uh, so for, a formula can be also uh, <laughs> a, an indicator of a form because that uh, is the beginning of a, of a, of a narrative text. Uh, uh, good morning is a formula. I hope this email finds you well. You can even find this now in all languages. It's funny how this entered also. How, and and that is something impro important to say that th this, these traditions uh, obviously, as Peter Koch said, they, they're not language specific. They can spread from one language to the other, other, another, if you think of the sonnet or of, of other things. Uh, uh, and of course, medieval uh, uh, traditions like Onotsuda, Cosa Seja, or Sepan Quantos Esta Carta Vieren, at the beginning of charters. And uh, frequently, we have a combination of formula and zone because the formula appears in a certain uh, zone. So, uh, now. Um, until this point, we can formulate two hypotheses, which are not really hypotheses because we have uh, just heard two days of confirmation of these uh, two hypotheses. Texts are not just products of lexicon and grammar. When speaking or writing, we repeat and evoke textual patterns and elements of previous texts. This is reflected not only in elements of content, but also in formal ones. The linguistic means we use, including syntactic and lexical ones, are related to discursive tradition. They, there is a mutual relationship between discourse tradition and historical grammar. And then there is a second hypothesis that there are features rather sensitive to discourse tradi uh, discursive traditionality and others more independent of it. So we should not now 
say that diachrony is just texts and textual tradition and, and maybe throw away uh, uh, the, 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 the diachrony and say everything is just text. Some people claim that, uh, but I think this is, and, and if I feel that in this room most people don't. So uh, uh, there's no radical constructivist here in the room uh, who defends that only texts exist and uh, the rest is some emerging uh, uh, casualty. We assume that there is a continuum between influence and dependence. The position of a feature along the continuum can vary throughout history. So there is no fixed position. Um, <coughs> and uh, we could now, according to this hypothesis, um, distinguish three possible scenarios. There could be more probably. One would be changes without any relationship to discourse tradition, so just diachrony, pure diachrony without textual um, interference. And I, I put a question mark to that because I don't know if that really exists. Phenomena that emerge in a certain discourse tradition and then oh, I have TD which is Tradition Discursiva, I see that this is translation. Um, uh, discourse tradition and then spread uh, um, to the whole language phenomena that emerge, emerge in a certain discourse tradition and remain restricted to it and there can be, be further scenarios. So let's just have a look at a few examples and how much time do I have? Like still uh, an hour and a half. Right? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll like ten more minutes or something? Okay. So um, a, 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 an example of changes without any relation to discourse tradition would be maybe the history of differential object marking in Spanish, uh, where there is kind of, a, uh, as, as we know, there, there, there is a, a universalist or typologist, uh, um, typological uh, explanation, um, and uh, Brenda Laca in, his, in, in her um, uh, diachronic study, which is part of this uh, Concepcion Compagni, historical grammar, but she worked with a little bit more material, but still not a very large corpus. Domin Spanish has globally undergone a process of expansion that corresponds to the predictions of a hierarchy that takes into account the animacy and definiteness properties of the direct object referent, and we know these universal um, schemes, uh, uh, um, the, the, the typology of DOM uh, by Judith Aysen in this case, but there are several uh, um, similar proposals that you have uh, animacy and definiteness as, as the two factors along uh, which uh, uh, DOM in the languages of the world, uh, of the world generally grammaticalizes. So it goes from uh, um, the human pronouns and uh, human um, uh, definites to um, and, and, and the, the last uh, uh, marked would be inanimate, uh, non-specific. And um, um, Brenda Laca looked at the history of Spanish with these categories and with this uh, rather restricted corpus. And um, what she found out, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. Um, uh, these are uh, Laka's um, uh, data. You, you just saw the result already. Uh, if we go through the history, we can see that the tendencies are not really um, too clear. Um, Sam, Sam, Sam yesterday said it would be nice. It, uh, Sam yesterday said it would be nice to have a clear line. We never have clear lines in the history of languages. But, but as you can see, we have here the uh, human definites. Uh, the, the, there is one line that works, and all the other ones. Uh, this is all Laka data, uh, data but if, if you look at Esperad la vieja, veis aquí sumoso. Citado uh, los padrinos. These are old, older texts, and then you have the new one, al ministro, a mi amo, al niño, all marked. And you, you can see that here, really, the diachrony works. And in all the other cases, um, it seems not to be working. And it's not due to textual uh, issues, but due to the lack of data. There, is, there are unclear cases from the very early. Uh, attestations, if you look at the seed again, uh, we have acolada a pizon, which are swords, uh, and a sword normal, uh, normally is an inanimate object, but they have proper names, so they 
somehow are prominent. Um, uh, and we have Babieka, which is uh, the, the horse of the Tzid, and it's also kind of a very prominent uh, referent uh, and has also a proper name. So uh, these cases should be uh, individually explained. And if we go through the diachrony of Spanish, we can uh, jump onto, uh, un until the, the, the period of early modern Spanish and see still residual archaic usages like uh, uh, una madama, un contramestre, uh, indefinite uh, uh, human reference that are not marked, or uh, plural human reference that are not marked, or even la nueva hermana, a definite human uh, reference that is not marked. But these are residu uh, residual uh, rests of, a, uh, uh, the, uh, of an older system, and the new system is emer emerging. emerging if, if we, we should look at more cases because it's really kind of a complex uh, situation, certain verbs, certain constructions, and even some collocates like a España, which is of course something special and must be marked, uh, and uh, there is a discussion about that, uh, and this is metalinguistically marked, so here we should maybe sort out some of the cases, but what we get, and we did the uh, study with a little bit more um, 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 of data, we have uh, 2,100 cases of done, the whole, uh, uh, all the examples that are in the Corpus del Nuevo Diccionario Histórico, and we get this line for the, uh, um, for, the for, an, an, uh, for animacy, and we see that animacy is really what uh, is beating uh, uh, the, all these ups and downs, I mean, of course it's not a straight line, but it would be rare to, it would be strange to get a really straight line, but it's a clear clear tendency, and this is diachrony. So, in, uh, in the case of Dom, I would say we have a general evolution that is not affected by discursive traditions. There are cases that are, the factors are quite complex, um, uh, uh, but the general trend, uh, trend remains the same, and there are only marginal cases that, in, uh, we, if we have large quantities of data, don't matter. The, the, the di diachrony shows up. Um, Okay, let's go a little bit faster. This is, uh, do, there, do we have partitive determiners in uh, the history of Spanish and Portuguese? Um, some people say yes, in the uh, medieval period we have them and then they disappear. Um, uh, in fact, um, David Gerard in his thesis showed that many of the cases that seem to be partitive determiners in, in, the, in the medieval text, like this is a Zid example again, uh, uh, really have reference uh, previously mentioned. Dadnos de Lagua, for example, seems to be Donne moi de l'eau, seems to be a French, French like partitive determiner, but uh, some lines uh, before uh, there is Falaron un vergel con una limpia fuente. Uh, there is the, the garden with a clear fountain is mentioned, so de, de Lagua is the, the water of the, the, of the fountain. Uh, other examples are uh, without previous mention of the referent, uh, del Zumo, de la Corteza, del Almodarush, um, um, but they are normally um, uh, restricted to uh, certain texts where in the pragmatic situation the referent is present. And uh, um, David Gerard showed that there is a, a bias for discourse traditions, uh, or for the discourse tradition of recipes, and that these, uh, um, um, these partitives, uh, uh, only partitive determiners, uh, uh, appear mainly in uh, um, recipes, which you have here. Um, uh, you have the difference between recipe, yes, no, and you have before the 16th century uh, the, the, the real partitive determiners only in recipes and not in other texts where uh, we only have uh, other cases. So the phenomenon of the partitive determiner, which in French and Northern Italian is grammaticalized, in Spanish has little existence, it disappears early, seems to be found preferable in text describing recipes. Um, and some of them are translations from French. Um, just um, uh, quickly two more cases. One is, uh, this is uh, a quote from this historical uh, syntax uh, work by Concepcion Compagni, uh, Angelita Martinez, who uh, worked uh, 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 about the, the history of the adjective positioning in uh, Spanish, and she found out that there seems to be a genre bias, but she doesn't really know how to catch it. Um, if we look at the, at the adjective positions, uh, we see that, for example, the Quixote has passages where we have systematic preposition of qualitative adjectives, and this is kind of an ironic imitation of a very 
sophisticated way of writing, um, um, and uh, he, he's really playing with that. And he <coughs> have other uh, parts of the novel where it's uh, completely different. So um, we did a study about uh, two editions of a, a Spanish journal uh, in the 1930s, ABC, which is a journal that has had a Francoist. Um, um, uh, uh, fascist edition on the, in, in Seville and uh, simultaneously a republican edition in, in Madrid. And if we look at the adjectives, we can see that the Francoist version has m uh, m many, many uh, preposed adjectives and the, the, the republican one is just, let's say, normal Spanish. Um, the, uh, it's interesting to look at that because the preposition of adjectives is three times higher in the Seville version than in the Madrid version. And uh, uh, famoso escultor, heroicos defensores, destrozado barrio, ilustre compañero, gloriosa nación. Um, and we see that this is not only typical for the Francoist um, uh, press, but also if we look at the, the, the speeches Franco held, uh, this is kind of a, a typical marker of this uh, um, militaristic and uh, nationalist uh, discourse and it differs from, uh, it, it's kind of two traditions within the same, you could say that there should be one journalistic uh, um, way of writing but you can see that they, they position, the two traditions, they position themselves in, in, in different, um, uh, yeah. In, 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 on different sides of, of, of the spectrum. The position of adjectives seems to be sensitive to discursive traditionality. Even so, the relationship seems motivated by particular preferences and does not alter the fundamental values, the basic values of antiposition, of postposition, um, but it shows that there can be different uh, sub-traditions in the same journalistic tradition. The same thing we have, for example, because you, you think that one tradition is one tradition. No, look at parliamentary discourses in Paris, for example. You see the, 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 the right and the left, and the, uh, uh, the, you, you see the parties in the usage of the subjunctif imparfait, for example, and other features. Um, Finally, I won't go into that, but this is uh, uh, Peter Koch's own example in order to explain the relationship between historical grammar and discourse tradition, the forms of address, in this case, Vuestra Merced, in the history of Spanish. And Koch shows how the, the, the new form emerges in a certain diplomatic tradition, then spreads to certain groups, and then becomes generalized in the language. So, but but the, 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 the spread starts in, at one point and then... Uh, uh, so it's clearly textually located and Koch says we have seen that the concept of discourse tradition is <coughs> indispensable for understanding degrees and itineraries of habitualization in linguistic change. It should be stressed that this is only one of several perspectives that reveal the relevance of our concept for diachronic linguistics. Um, let us recall that in the case, case studied here, Vuestra Merced, the concept of discursive tradition has helped to specify the validity of the linguistic rules involved in the change. One could therefore speak, first of all, of the relevance of the concept for a microscopy of the development of linguistic change. I will <coughs> skip the next uh, quotation um, because it talks again about the two filters. The case of Vuestra Merced shows that discursive traditionality must be taken into account when studying a phenomenon of grammatical change, and this leads us to a continuum of um, evolutions that are rather independent from discursive traditionality on others that they are strongly dependent, uh, uh, affected by discursive tra traditionality, traditionality. We have here differential object marking, adjective position, the partitives, Vuestra Merced, other features like the future of subjunctive uh, uh, and, 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 and the, the elements can move along this continuum uh, during diachrony and uh, what uh, Wendy mentioned yesterday was also that they can even be on different points at the same time. Uh, so it's much more, it's, it's not so easy but it helps us maybe to locate uh, uh, the, the elements. There is a diachronic dynam uh, dynamism of the position and um, um, we should also dis uh, distinguish frequency versus, versus, versus mm -hmm. function. Okay. I wanted to say a few words on grammaticalization, but I will maybe skip that just very shortly. Uh, this is a study on casu um, in, uh, uh, in Portu the history of Portuguese, um, and, and uh, 
joint work with David Geras and uh, it's uh, a, 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 a new element that starts, that emerged in, in legal traditions, in, in certain um, uh, prepositional constructions like in caso que, no caso que, caso que, uh, and then it becomes more and more caso, um, 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 uh, a conditional conjunction, first in Brazilian Portuguese and then it spreads over to uh, Portugal and it goes from uh, uh, distance to immediacy, so it emerges, it's a change from above, it emerges in, in the legal discourse, it goes uh, throughout and now it's a generally unmarked uh, element in the whole language as uh, in, 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 in Brazil as well as in Portugal. Um, so this is an example of a change from uh, above. So we can uh, look at grammaticalization from below where uh, innovative elements might start in one textual tradition and then spread to others uh, or from above as in the uh, caso uh, um, example or in others like uh, the uh, isto es, esto es uh, in Spanish which also comes from a legal tradition it est uh, and then spreads to the whole language. So the uh, claim is here that the spread of a broader communicative spectrum is a correlate of grammaticalization so that we might claim that a parameter not traditionally included in grammaticalization research is the broadening of communicative scope in the continuum between communicative distance and immediacy. The more grammaticalized an element becomes, the wider will be the wider, I almost read, the wider will be the range of discourse traditions where the element may be found. So, um, just one last word on frameworks, um, because as I told you, I mean, you know that the concept emerged in a structuralist tradition. Peter Koch was not really only a structuralist, he was kind of a, um, um, he had a strongly, uh, a strong <coughs> cognitivist sympathy. Um, I think in, the, the, in, a, in a radical, radically con uh, constructivist uh, uh, approach, the concept would be redundant because, uh, because every, everything could be reduced to textual tradition, but I think I would rather say this is not very likely to help us too uh, much, um, but I would claim that the concept or a concept like that uh, is necessary uh, in, in, in generative um, um, uh, linguistics as well because it's simply um, an empirical fact that something like discourse tradition exists and that uh, any framework must take, him, uh, must take this phenomenon into account. So it's a f somehow framework-free notion of, or a framework-free framework, if you want to. Um, so just two traditions to finish. Yeah, that's evocation, of yeah. course, you know what I'm talking about. Thanks. Thank you for your sparkling talk. Now you can ask Kevin about those if you want. Um, so I'm sure there will be loads of questions. Um, Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the yeah. Um, yeah the, the, I, I have not, not looked at Portuguese, but the, the value is more or less the same, and uh, it's just, just the marked the marked position. So it's used, and and, and it, it enters a certain, uh, or it it, it um, achieves certain stylistic values. Well, and yeah, and I'm not, I'm not, uh, and of course this is an example where you, we, we could discuss about is this discourse is tradition or is this just a stylistic variation or is this stability of grammar because you see it from uh, throughout the history of the languages that there is just a possibility of preference. But of course it creates 
some kind of evocation of traditionality, especially if it's uh, <coughs> appearing in, in the context of certain adjectives. So it's um, um, maybe more than just a, 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 a diachronic stability. There, 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 there is this, uh, let's say, social function of the, of the two uh, different ways of saying things. Mm -hmm. um, in, there's this Catalan uh, human, uh, human like program called Polonia, and when they want to mock Francoist, um, Francoist novel, like the Francoist news, and they, they try to kind of like explain reality from a Francoist perspective in an erotic way, the one thing they always do is adjective to phrase it. Mm -hmm. Like that is the yeah, Francoist works. marker. Yeah. So, like, just like piggybacking on that, like, in, in, in the Spanish case, from the Catalan perspective, that's how you sound fascist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 It's good to know. It's, <laughs> now, what, what is, what is in, 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 in fact uh, common to all uh, discursive traditions is that they are signs. So they have a semiotic value. Mm, so they, yeah. they, they, they add something to a text that goes beyond. The, the, the content of the text and, and, and they are recognized uh, as uh, signs that, for example, are associated with um, certain ideological traditions or with uh, particular situations or with um, text uh, types or whatever. So they are uh, identifiers of, uh, uh, of something. Yeah. With respect to adjective proposing, it might be interesting, and fascism, it might be interesting <laughs> to look at uh, the Instituto Luce um, journalist in Italy that might be the initiators of this trend. And that uh, I, I recognize that in Italian fascism mm -hmm. and uh, the Instituto Luce, which was founded by the regime in the 20s, might be actually. Mm -hmm. the, Initial starter of the, this uh, tradition of anthroposing. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But it's 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 not the it's not preposing just preposing. It's also the the like the the, the military and the, the so the the, the 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 list of adjectives like heroico, for example, yeah. is just a typical uh, um, or. Um, the, the, I, I have this. Um, I once analyzed several discourses of uh, Franco himself, and then and the, there you have it systematically. Yes. But yeah, it's not just a proposing because in, in French, proposing of an adjective is essentially a register issue outside mm -hmm. a dozen very short, very frequent adjectives. All the rest is literature, but it doesn't have a Mm -hmm. aware. So, yes, so there's obviously something, another layer there. Uh, can, I, can I ask you, you, you said the, the spread starts in those texts, and the, or it stops in those texts, or whatever. Uh, surely what we mean is that the, the, the change, or the, the spread, or the beginning of the change, or the end, is documented in that set of texts rather than started by this set of texts. Yeah, 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 of course, yeah, yeah. of course. Because it's, you know, it's a shorthand, of course, that we use, that, that I've heard at different moments, but it's, there, there are windows onto a practice rather than the, the practice itself. So e both things, uh, in the case of changes from above, sometimes the text itself is the place of innovation. Mm -hmm. If you think of Latinizing structures that are really uh, emerging out of translation, for example, like the id est, which becomes esto es mm -hmm. in Old Spanish, and uh, isto es uh, also in Old Portuguese, which is a, a kind of a textual organizing marker in Latin texts, and it and and, and then it spreads to the to the spoken language as a discourse marker. Um, there, I would probably assume that uh, the, the the written tradition uh, is even the, the the source of the new phenomenon. Um, and this is also the case for, um, if, if we look at these uh, steps that the written language is, is, is making, like with the 
uh, in the first century with the emergence of, of uh, text based on Roman law in, in, in Occitan, for example, where you have a degree of elaboration that you don't find beforehand in, and that, 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 that's, and you find structures that are probably not spoken ones, though they are just, uh, you need it for the written texts, but you won't find them in the spoken uh, vernacular. The, but the, one of the questions is always, wh where is the vernacular? Uh, the vernacular? And um, uh, so the first uh, comment is, do we believe in the existence of a vernacular or do we think there is just text? And I believe in the existence of a vernacular and I think that, for example, if people use the future subju subjunctive mood in, in Spanish, this is just a, a, a technique completely restricted to, to a kind of an artifact um, uh, of writing uh, when they want to um, argue against Catalan independence, for example, and they have three uh, future subjunctive forms in the corresponding law, um, and so they, they, they really increased in the last year a lot the use of the future subjunctive. No, um, but uh, the, the, um, the, this is something that is not active for Spanish uh, uh, for for Spanish speakers anymore. So there can be, um, yeah, preservation of of, of of completely archaic usages only in in writing that doesn't have to do anything with the vernacular. Well, it's, it's question raised by Gliber, isn't it? I mean, he, he looks at all these types of texts, and mm -hmm. so 